week about safety issues aboard the oil rig, laws governing compensation for their loss, and the moratorium on offshore drilling. This, uh, there was also more order. testimony from experts on the impact the disaster is having on tourism, marine horizon, life, and health. Gulf Coast this House spill. Energy Subcommittee hearing took place like in to Shelmut, Louisiana. It's chaired Bernard by Congressman Parish Bart Stupak. It's here in about Shemet four hours. For being gracious host for today's hearing. Also wish to thank the United States Coast Guard, United States Fish and Wildlife, Louisiana Fish and Wildlife, and the Louisiana Air National Guard for our trip down to the marshes last night. We, after this hearing, we'll be further down in the Gulf later today as members are still exploring uh, the impact that it has had on this region. I'd also like to recognize two of Louisiana's congressmen. Uh, congressman Charlie Malone saw I'm supposed to be here. I'm sure he'll be here any minute. Uh, he's running a little bit late, but he'll be here. And Steve Scalise, who are with us. Neither of them are members of the subcommittee. They are members of the full committee of the Energy and Commerce Committee. And because this is a field hearing in their home state, I ask unanimous consent that they be allowed to make an opening statement and ask questions during today's hearing. Without objection, so ordered. We'll now hear from the members for their opening statements. The chairman and ranking member will be recognized for five minute openings and other members will be recognized for three minutes. I will begin. Let me be begin today's hearing by expressing on behalf of all members of Congress, our condolences to the friends and family members of those who died or were injured in the April 20th explosion on board Deepwater Horizon oil rig in the Gulf of Mexico. Eleven lives were lost and 15 people were injured. Our hearts, thoughts, and prayers go out to those families and to the thousands of people impacted by this disaster. Disaster as the well continues to spew oil into the Gulf and onto your shores. Today's Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations continues our examination into the explosion and oil leak in the Gulf of Mexico. This is the second hearing of our subcommittee has conducted on the Deepwater Horizon incident and the third hearing that the Committee on Energy and Commerce has held on this issue. While this oil spill is an unprecedented environmental disaster, it pales in comparison to the tragic loss of life. Our hope is that with greater understanding of the effects of such a catastrophe, we can ensure it will never happen again. On May 12th, our subcommittee held a hearing into the events surrounding Deepwater Horizon explosion and oil spill. During that hearing, we learned that BP, Transocean, and Halliburton failed to address various issues with the rig, the well, and the blowout preventer prior to the explosion. BP and Transocean failed to ensure that the blowout preventer was fully operational. BP and Halliburton failed to identify discrepancies in pressure tests done during the cementing of the well. Subsequently, BP briefed our committee on the progress of its internal investigation. BP reported it had concerns about whether proper procedures were followed at critical times prior to and on the day of the explosion. As a result of the explosion, each day 12,000 and 19,000 barrels of oil are leaking into the Gulf Coast, threatening beaches, fishing grounds, critical wetland habitat, sea life, and waterfall. BP officials said under a worst case scenario, the spill rate could reach as much as 60,000 barrels, 2.5 million gallons a day. Several attempts by BP to stop the flow of oil have proven unsuccessful. No one knows the full extent of the damage to the Gulf Coast region. It may be several years before we can quantify the true impact of this massive oil spill, but here's what we do know. 88,500 88,500 square miles of coastal waters, 37% of U.S. waters in the Gulf have been closed, resulting in a significant loss of income to fishermen and businesses. Oil from the spill has reached barrier islands in Alabama and Mississippi and just reached Florida's shores this weekend. 37,193 claims have been filed with BP to repay those who have suffered a financial loss as a result of this spill. More than one million gallons of dispersants have been used to treat the area. These dispersants can be toxic to some, some organisms living in the coastal waters. Less than two weeks ago, some oil spill cleanup and recovery workers were hospitalized after complaining of dizziness, headaches, and respiratory problems. Several community groups have complained that BP failed to provide adequate protection for these workers. 
More than 700 birds, numerous sea turtles, and at least one dolphin have been found covered in oil and dead on our Gulf shore. The Deepwater Horizon rig explosion and spill has had far-reaching repercussions, forever changing the lives of the 126 people on board the rig and their families. Each of our witnesses today has a story to share with America about how their lives have been changed by this horrible tragedy. On our first panel, we'll hear from Natalie Rostow and Courtney Kemp, whose husbands died during the tragic explosion on the oil rig. We will also hear from Gulf Coast residents about the effects of the oil spill and how it's impacted their lives and livelihoods across the Gulf Coast. Clarence Ronnie Duplessis is a commercial fisherman who rely on the coastal waters for his livelihood. He has been deeply impacted by the closing of the coastal waters and is now struggling to get by in what was supposed to be the first good year of season of fishing since Hurricane Katrina. Dr. Moby Solange is president and executive director of the Institute of Marine Mammals Sciences, protecting marine mammals from exposure to toxins like oil and dispersants. Dr. Solange has studied and written about the impact of Louisiana crude in fisheries. Mr. Kelby Lynn is the owner of ACP Real Estate, a beachfront rental and real estate broker on Dolphin Island, Alabama, who has, been a, who has seen a substantial decline in rental reservations as a result of the oil spill. The drop began to occur almost immediately after the oil spill, despite the fact that oil only reached Dolphin Island last week. Wilma Subra has recently conducted a health survey of residents of the Gulf region and those working on the cleanup to determine whether they have been physically affected by pollutants from the oil and the dispersants. I want to thank each of our witnesses for sharing their stories today, especially Ms. Rosto and Ms. Kemp. Your testimony to this subcommittee will be valuable in helping us to determine this horrible, help us to address this horrible human and environmental tragedy. I'd now like to turn to the ranking member of the subcommittee, Mr. Burgess of Texas, for an opening statement. Before you do that, comment Mr. Milan Song. I thought I saw him come in. There he is. Charlie, thanks for being here. Mr. Burgess, opening statement, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for convening this hearing. Certainly, we want to thank uh, the St. Bernard's Parish Council, uh, President and Council for generously offering this venue for the subcommittee's use. Uh, certainly want to welcome our witnesses here today. St. Bernard Parish totally devastated by Hurricane Katrina. In fact, my first trip here was September of 2005. I came down at the request of a group of doctors at your hospital and stood in the parking lot of your hospital mm -hmm. and saw firsthand what, uh, what you were dealing with. I remember driving through the town. We had to come in through a checkpoint that was secured by FEMA. Uh, you had to have special permission to come into town. And FEMA, of course, recorded that the town was 100% destroyed. What I wasn't prepared for as we drove along the streets were evidence that people were moving back into the area in spite of the fact that FEMA had the entire area cordoned off. People were in their front yards, uh, living in tents and tarps and going about their daily lives in spite of all of the devastation around them. This area has extraordinary resilience. I personally witnessed it, and sadly, that resilience is once again being tested to the maximum. We will hear today from, about the local impacts from the oil spill, impacts which have a tremendous impact on the livelihoods of the people in St. Bernard's Parish and Plaquemines Parish, particularly, and throughout the Gulf Coast. I think it is both helpful and important to listen to those most affected by the spill to understand their perspectives on this catastrophic event. And also, Mr. Chairman, with you, I offer my condolences to Natalie Rashto and Courtney Kemp, who will be speaking with us. They both lost husbands on the Deepwater Horizon. I appreciate your being here this morning. I know it is important that America hears your stories, and I look forward to your testimony. We will hear about the impacts to people who make a living off of Louisiana's fisheries. Since the spill, the state has closed vast sections of Louisiana's shrimping grounds and oyster beds, bringing immediate hardship to people who rely on this industry. The federal government, as the chairman said, the federal government has closed large tracts in the Gulf, over 88,000 square miles, about 37% of the Gulf's waters closed to fishing. It leaves almost two-thirds open, along with other state-controlled waters, but there's legitimate concern that the demand for products 
from anywhere in the Gulf will plummet as people watch the spill on the news and become concerned about the long-term fishing aspects. And I say this as a dedicated and aggressive consumer of crustaceans. You can't help but notice uh, what you're seeing on the television screens currently, and it is going to have an impact on the desire of consumers to buy those products. The news images and actual impacts are also hitting the Gulf Coast's large tourism industry. And again, I think we're scheduled to hear about more about that this morning. The oil spill has done much to reveal the delicate balance and the connections between nature and the various industries that rely upon the resources here in the Gulf Coast. These industries, the fisheries, tourism, and industry are all significantly intertwined and where one is impacted, it directly affects the others. As we gather important information from the witnesses today, we should keep in mind this balance. Just last week, the President and the Secretary of the Interior announced a moratorium on drilling in waters over 500 feet. The Wall Street Journal last Friday reported that even permits for shallow water drilling have been rescinded. While we are still trying to evaluate the economic <coughs> impacts of these actions, initial evidence suggests that thousands of people who had been relying upon activities within the energy industry for their livelihoods will also be affected. According to a Bloomberg News report, shutting down 33 deep water rigs will cost as many, cost as, many as 6,000 6, jobs in the next three weeks alone. And the New, York, New Orleans Times-Picayune reports that each job in the energy exploration supports an additional four jobs providing supplies and services. We cannot lose sight of the role that the energy in the, in the economy of the Gulf Coast. Energy helps power the other industries both directly and indirectly through economic growth and income. To hinder this aspect of the economy while other sectors are struggling is not a good way to help the Gulf Coast address this <coughs> unfolding tragedy. This subcommittee is in the midst of a close and thorough investigation of BP and the other subcontractors behind what has become a national tragedy. I am confident that at the end of the day, we will identify the factors and decisions that led to the catastrophic blowout. We are rapidly developing information that at least suggests this tragedy was entirely avoidable. In time, our investigation will inform what practices need to be put in place or enforced to maximize a safe and secure American energy production. But Mr. Chairman, we have to get it right. This is an important hearing to take a close look at the impacts of oil spills, to get an on-the-ground perspective so sorely needed in Washington, and it is a chance to understand what happens when the delicate balance between nature and industry is upset, and to identify policies that will help right that balance, and I pray that writing occurs soon. I'll yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Burgess. Next we'll go. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to also thank the St. Bernard's Parish Council for hosting us today. And to our first panel uh, witnesses, Ms. Rashto and Ms. Kemp, I want to thank you for having the courage to come share your stories with us today. It's never easy, and there's nothing we can do today to replace the pain of your loss. But the one thing we can do is never forget what your husbands went through and what those other men on the rig went through, and to get to the bottom of why that happened and make sure that it never happens again so that no other families have to go through what you have gone through, so thank you for coming today. I think that one of our witnesses on the second panel, Mr. Chairman, Clarence Duplessis, summarized the concerns of most of us on the committee in his opening statement when he said there are really more questions than answers for what happened out on that Deepwater Horizon rig. That came out during our first hearing, and one of the things that concerns many of us is the story keeps shifting. We were originally told that there was a release at the wellhead of around 1,000 barrels per day. Then when BP CEO appeared and testified in front of our subcommittee hearing, that number was up to 5,000 barrels per day. And just last week, we were told that BP was excited because they were capturing 10,000 barrels per day, which was estimated to be only one quarter to one half of the release from the wellhead the environmental and economic devastation to this area and the entire Gulf Coast region cannot even be comprehended at this stage. 
our job as the Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee is to get answers to those questions, to find out why this happened, to find out how it happened, to find out who is responsible and what they must do to be held accountable. One of the things we know is that the economic devastation is going to be severe and long-lasting, and the witnesses we are going to hear from today will help us put a human face on that tragedy. But there are also disturbing parts to this story that we need answers to. And one of the things that we have done is ask for specific information from BP, Halliburton, Transocean, and others involved on that drilling rig. And one of the things that is disturbing is when we ask for specific information, as I did following our May 12th <coughs> hearing, and getting back a response only after a second follow-up request was sent that was incomplete and ignored the request that we made at the time of the initial hearing. Mr. Chairman, it's obvious to me that we are going to have to continue to pursue answers to the questions. We need to have additional hearings as necessary until the people of Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, and indeed the entire United States know what happened and what we're doing about it. And I'll yield back the balance of my time. And good morning. I feel sort of like deja vu all over again. In September of 2005, my staff and I came to hear firsthand the health impacts, but most importantly, the health needs of the people of New Orleans in the wake of Hurricane Katrina. It was the first of many visits, and now with this region barely back on its feet from that tragedy, we're here faced with another one, which in the words of many residents, is and will be far worse for many, many reasons. So thank you, Chairman Stupak and Ranking Member Burgess for having this oversight hearing, not in Washington, but right here where its impact is being seen and felt. First of all, my condolences to the families of the 11 workers who were lost, and thank you to Ms. Mrs. Kemp and Mrs. Rashto for joining us this morning, for being willing to testify, for your courage and that of the other families who you represent, and for the important positions that you're taking on the future of our offshore drilling in spite of your loss, as well as on the death of the, on the High Seas Compensation Act, which is an insult to the dedication of the oil workers and the families who sacrifice when they leave home for weeks at a time. We wish a speedy and full recovery to those who were injured and to those whose lives and livelihood have been disrupted and damaged for what remains an uncertain future. We know what lies ahead will not be easy, but we commit to working with President Obama to do everything we can to bring your communities and your lives back to as close to normal as possible, as soon as possible. In every briefing and hearing of this subcommittee and those in my other Committee of Natural Resources, I've asked BP, the Coast Guard, and others for assurance that everything that needed to be done was being done to prevent both short and long-term health impacts, including providing and using protective gear. It seems that the assurances which we received were empty. Without the insistence of residents, the decisions of courts, and the vigilance and advocacy of groups like Lean and LMRK and Subra, it appears that nothing would have been done despite what we know from past experiences. This is very troubling, and I look forward to hearing from our witnesses on what they feel we as a committee and a Congress need to do at this point. I remain reluctant on the issue of new drilling, but I am clear that strengthened regulation and enforcement that markedly improve safety measures for the offshore drilling that is now permitted, that increase accountability of the companies involved in the process, and that the fullest possible recovery for all that has been damaged must be a part of our responsibility going forward. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. That concludes my statement, and I yield back my time. Thank you. And, and as members know, uh, our subcommittee just don't do a hearing or two. Uh, this is our second hearing. We'll be doing another one within the next two weeks with uh, the head of BP, Tony Hayward, up in Washington. And later this month, we have a fourth hearing set. So as you know, like Hurricane Katrina, our, our committee came down. I led that group. Uh, our, our committee came down and to deal with the health aspect. 
after Hurricane Katrina. So our committee will, will stay with this issue. And I should be noted, we have, if I count right, nine members here. Uh, rather unheard of to have nine members come down for a field hearing. Each hearing we've had on this uh, tragic circumstances has been all members have showed up. So I want to thank the members for taking the extra time, for being down here and taking time out of their schedules. And of course, uh, Mr. Malone Song and Mr. Scalise also, who are valuable members of our committee. Next, we'll hear from uh, Mr. Markey from Massachusetts. Mr. Markey is chair of the Energy and Environment Subcommittee of the Energy and Commerce Committee. Mr. Mr. Markey is also Chairman of the Select Committee on Climate Change. Mr. Markey, opening statement, three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Our hearts go out to those whose loved ones uh, were lost in this explosion. Uh, we thank you for being here today. It takes a lot of courage, Ms. Rochelle and Ms. Kemp. We thank you for being here. It's important that you're here. And, uh, uh, and we all extend our sympathies to you and to your families. Uh, we began to appreciate how vital uh, our role uh, in the oceans uh, play in our economy as soon as we saw the impact from that explosion. And we're become increasingly frustrated as each rosy assurance provided by BP failed to be true and every attempt to stop the oil's flow failed to work. Every day as this oil encro encroaches, uh, on the wetlands, estuaries, and beaches, the entire nation shares in the anxiety and anger felt by the people living in the Gulf region. It is clear by BP's actions that while they spent billions of dollars to develop technologies that would allow it to drill ultra deep into the ocean, that investment was not matched with the development of ultra safe technologies that could prevent contain and clean up the consequences of these type of drilling operations. It has also become clear that just as no one has capped BP's profits, the great damage it has caused, um, and, uh, and as a result, we must make sure uh, that BP must repay everything that they have caused in terms of damage, and that should not be capped as well. BP must be held accountable. Oil has made its way onto the beaches of four coastal uh, states from Louisiana to Florida. As of yesterday, approximately 33% of the fisheries in the Gulf of Mexico had been closed, depriving people of their livelihoods. I've seen firsthand with the other members the stain of BP's oil on the cane in the marshland and heard of the birds, the fish, and the dolphins that have already been killed by oil. We've also heard reports that there may be plumes of subsurface oil posing an insidious threat to deep sea coral and other marine life, oil that will not make its presence known by the clear signs of tar balls or oil birds, but which could nevertheless harm generations of aquatic life. Remarkably, last week, BP Chief Executive Tony Hayward claimed that BP didn't have enough resources in its toolkit to handle the Gulf uh, oil disaster. That is why this week I will introduce the oil SOS bill that will require companies to fund research and development for upgraded safety and cleanup tools so that in the future companies like BP will never again be relying on 30-year-old technologies to deal with 21st century problems. That is unfair to the families who must suffer the consequences of the lack of preparation by BP. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Markey. Mr. Gett from Colorado, opening statement, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. In late August of, 9th, of 2005, a perfect storm, Hurricane Katrina, formed over the Gulf, devastating homes and taking a terrible toll on human life and the economy. This spring, five years later, the, the residents of this area being resilient and caring and working hard had just started to turn their economy around and rebuild their lives when another perfect storm hit, this one being entirely man-made. And the Deepwater Horizon explosion and oil spill is a national tragedy, and we're all con terribly concerned about it, but the local effects are felt far more acutely. 
The human impact in terms of loss of life and injuries and the economic impact to the local fishing and tourism industries and the environmental impact along the Gulf Coast are all terrible and frankly the effects will last indefinitely longer than we know. Accidents on this scale raise many questions about what went wrong and in this case as usual there's no single answer on who to blame. Um, we've had, as the chairman said, several hearings in this committee and also in the Natural Resources Committee on which several of us sit, where we've probed the, probed the causes of the accident. But what we've been able to tell to date is that it really was a perfect storm. We had a blowout preventer testing and certification problem. We had faulty cementing. We had a lack of a chain of command. We had many, many problems that are going to take a long time to sort out. But as the chairman said, this committee is nothing if not stubborn and diligent. And we're going to get to the bottom of it. Because if we don't, this could happen again. And we can't let this happen again in terms of human life, in terms of loss of ecosystem, in terms of loss of economy and jobs. We, can, we might have another environmental perfect storm. Mother Nature is unpredictable. But we can't be causing these impacts ourselves. We have to make sure that systems are in place so that when the important um, drilling that occurs out here is done, it's done in an environmentally safe way and in a way that will save human lives. Natalie and Courtney, I want to echo what my colleagues have said. This is a terrible loss to you and to your families. And we are here to sympathize with your losses. But much more than that, we want to do what you want to do. We want to make sure that we work with you so that this never happens to any other families. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Ms. Schakowsky, opening statement. Ms. Schakowsky is from Illinois. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Burris for, Bur Burgess for uh, holding this very important hearing here in Louisiana. And I'm really happy that we can be here to offer uh, support and solidarity to our colleagues, Congressman Melanson and, and Scalise. Um, and uh, over the last six weeks, we've been reminded once again of the tremendous cost of our nation's reliance on oil to meet our energy needs. The oil spill in the Gulf Coast is not only a human tragedy leading to the loss of 11 lives, but an unprecedented environmental disaster and yet another economic catastrophe for this region. For what it's worth, we are here in part to express our sympathy and support not only to the families of those workers who perish, but also to everyone who lives or works in the Gulf region. But I know you want more than sympathy. You want to see action. And to Mrs. Rashto and Mrs. <coughs> Kemp, I want to express my gratitude and admiration for the courage that you have for being here today and turning your personal tragedy into suggestions of what we can do better to avoid this in the, in the future. The Deepwater Horizon spill is a devastating reminder that the United States must implement a comprehensive energy strategy that weans our nation off of oil and spurs development of cleaner renewable sources like wind and solar power. But as long as we drill, we must enforce, vigorously enforce current law. We also have to quickly determine holes in that regulatory and enforcement framework. For example, Canada requires a relief well at the very same time any deep water well is drilled. I also believe it's imperative that we raise or completely eliminate the cap on damages imposed on oil and gas companies that, cost, that cause environmental catastrophes. It's unconscionable that current law allows companies like BP to make billions of dollars in profits and then when an accident occurs the law protects, well we'll see, but may protect them from paying for the damages they cause. But the po point of today's hearing is to learn about the impact of the oil spill at Deepwater Horizon drilling rig site on the, uh, on the Gulf region. And we're hearing from, of course, these two 
widows today, uh, representatives from industries that are being hit the hardest, and I want to thank each and every one of you for being with us today. I know how difficult the last six weeks have been, or I can try and know that, but I want you to know that we truly appreciate hearing your perspective of this unprecedented disaster, and we will be working to make sure that we address the problems and assure that it never happens again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Let's hear from our two uh, native sons here, uh, Charlie Malonsong, member of a valuable member of our committee. Opening statement, please, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, Ms. Rosto and Ms. Kemp. Um, on behalf of Peachy and I, um, our condolences to you, and thank you for having the courage to be here today. Um, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Ranking Member Burgess, thank you uh, for taking the time and interest in my state, our people, our environment, our livelihood. Thank you for coming to this field hearing and working to ensure that a tragedy like this doesn't happen again. The news coverage is constantly reminding us that we are facing the largest environmental disaster in our nation's history. It's hard not to draw comparisons to a similarly grim milestone five years ago when this district and our state bore the brunt of the largest natural man-made natural disaster in history as well. I mention this association because it's easy to become distracted by the torrent of bad news that streams all day long. But we're here today to help make sure the effects of this tragedy on real people's lives aren't forgotten and aren't repeated. And I might add a footnote, Louisiana is still open for business and even more importantly, the communities right now along the coast need for their citizens of the state and the neighboring states uh, to come and uh, enjoy Louisiana. And uh, we need to make certain that this investigation into what went wrong is thoroughly carried out. We must examine all solutions that may guard against a disaster like this ever happening again. We are fortunate to have witnesses today who will share their frustrating and heartbreaking stories with us. These stories are not easy to share, so I sincerely appreciate the willingness of the witnesses to come before this group and to share their personal accounts. Hopefully this hearing and others like it will reveal the pattern of missteps and negligence that led to this continually growing catastrophe. Because as responders work as fast as possible to cap this well and protect our marshes, it is important to identify what must change to keep another disaster like this from striking our fragile, fragile coast. In addition, we must make sure that the safety of the workers in America and on these rigs are protected. These rigs in the Gulf represent a tremendous segment of the economy in South Louisiana, and the sooner we ascertain the vulnerabilities, the sooner we can fix those problems and have our men and women working again in a safe environment. I'd also like to thank the expert witness panel for participating today. I'm afraid that when the cameras and the national attention leaves, we in Louisiana will only be just be commencing with our recovery. The toxic pollution in the Gulf waters could knock out our fisheries and industries along that area and our way of life for years to come, if not for decades. We need your expertise to help recognize the actions we can take to mitigate these scenarios and to make our resources productive again as soon as possible. Again, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member, thank you for holding this hearing. That concludes the opening statement by members. Um, let's have our first panel of witnesses. On our first panel, we have Ms. Natalie Rashto, whose husband Shane was killed during the explosion of Deepwater Horizon oil rig. Shane and Natalie were married for four and a half years and have a three-year-old daughter together. Ms. Courtney Kemp, whose husband Wyatt was killed during the explosion. Wyatt and Courtney were high school sweethearts and were married five and a half years and have a three-year-old and a four-month-old daughter. Thank you for both for being here. It's the policy of this subcommittee to take all testimony under oath. Please be advised that you have the right under the rules of the House to be advised by counsel during your testimony. Do you wish to be represented by counsel? Uh, Ms. Rashto? Pull that mic forward, please. Okay. Do you, would you just, for the record, identify your counsel's name? Okay. If during testimony, if you want to consult with them, just take a moment and do so. If they testify, they would have to be sworn in. Yeah. Okay. Ms. Kemp, are you representing counsel? 
I am not formally represented, but I do have Mr. Barry Roach here with me today to uh, give legal advice and guidance. Very good. And again, any time during your testimony or questions, if you'd like to consult with them before you answer, please do. Thank okay. You. Okay. So I'm going to ask you, uh, please rise, raise your right hand, take the oath. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, matter pending before this committee? Yes. yes. Let the record reflect the witnesses replied in the affirmative. You are now under oath. We'll now hear your opening statement from, our, from each of you. Uh, Ms. Rochstow, do you want to begin, please? Yes. I'm going to ask you to pull that mic up closer to you so we can all hear. Here we go. Good morning. Before I begin, I would first like to thank each and every one of you again for allowing me to speak today on behalf of my husband, Shane Rostro, who was tragically killed in the Deepwater Horizon explosion, myself and our wonderful son, Blaine. In the early hours of April 21st, when I received the news of the explosion and the fire, I never thought I would be sitting here. I never thought I would go home to a bright-eyed three-year-old and have to face the fact that his dad and my husband would never come home to us. Every three weeks when Blaine and I would give Shane our last love sending him off for three weeks, I always feared the helicopter ride. But never did this tragedy ever come to mind. But through God's grace, family and friends, we're making it through. After all the safety schools, meetings, fire drills, and safety regulations, I knew he was safe. When the events of the Deepwater Horizon explosion started to unfold, I asked myself, will I ever personally recover? What if he's out there and they just didn't look long enough? As the days passed, Shane's absence became reality. My husband took great pride in his job. He loved his work and all his Deepwater Horizon family. But most important, he knew Offshore provided the life he wanted for our son. He loved us unselfishly and provided a lifestyle that allowed me to attend college and to be at home with our son. During Shane's off weeks, he spent every day with Blaine, passing his love for the outdoors, hunting and fishing, and doing for others. A little background on Shane, how Shane and I began. We met at 15 years old. We were high school sweethearts. At 18 years old, I found out I was pregnant. Shane came to me the day I found out I was pregnant, and he said, I'm going to be here for you and Blaine, and the only way I know to do it is to go offshore, and he did. That's what he did for me and Blaine. As the days passed, I asked why, what happened. The life Blaine and I knew were, was over. My wonderful love story had came to an end. Though he is a mirror image of his daddy, Blaine has now has a void that will never be filled. When I, the day I found out, when I got that phone call at 6 o'clock, April 21st, and I heard what had happened, I knew he was safe. I just knew he was coming home. As I went, I went to Fushan because the only thing I knew was to get closer to the water, just to get to the water. I knew that's where he would be. As the hours passed and I received the phone call that he was on the missing list and they were searching for him and um, I was devastated. I never thought it would be on this level ever. As I sit here today, though, I come with a new perspective, a perspective that I hope can make a difference, one that will ensure safety to every man in the oil field. And I do fully support offshore drilling and always will, because I know, like my husband Shane, many men and women depend on this means, this as a means to provide for their families and to also to provide our country with a commodity that is necessary to everyday life. I would like to leave here today knowing that because of my husband's tragic death, we can begin to focus on making safety the most important priority. Not to focus on making more safety regulations, but on ways to effectively implement the ones that we already have. This tragedy will not be in vain because as of right now, my husband's death is in vain. But it will not be in vain if it serves to make the lives of every man and woman working in the oil field the top priority and cause these powerful oil companies to know that they will be held accountable for their actions. 
My intense interest in Shane's work led us through many conversations detailing work carried out on the Deepwater Horizon and the many safety practices that were in place. It is my hope that these 11 men who suffered a tragic death will serve as a motive to enforce safety above all others. In the weeks that Shane was home, the last time he left to go offshore, we had many detailed conversations of the wrong that was going on out there, all the mud they were losing, the high pressure situations they were in. I pray every day when I wake and at bedtime prayers with Blaine that I can sit him down one day and be able to tell him that his daddy was a hero. A hero to all oldfield men and women because his death changed the heart and soul of those who place their business agendas over the importance of life. In closing, I would like to, well, what I would like to accomplish today before I say that is the removal of death on the high seas act. It is beyond me that any man that is injured out there has more right than a man that was killed providing for his country and his family. In closing, I would like to ask that the next time you see a picture of the Deepwater Horizon in flames or hear about the oil spill, you think about this. The flow of oil eventually will be stopped. Slowly, the environment will recover. The Gulf, I pray, will continue to provide us with the oil and gas and many other things that we all enjoy. But the lives of the 11 men, their survivors, and heroes of the Deepwater Horizon will forever be changed. We can only hope that the legacy of this tragedy will be much more than a devastating oil spill, but an unfortunate tragedy that prompted change, creating a safer environment for those who love their work in the oil fields of the Gulf of Mexico. Thank you. Ms. Kemp, your opening statement, please. Good morning. My name is Courtney Kemp, and I'm from... I ask you to pull that up a little bit if you can, or scooch up a little bit more to the table, or slide over that way. Good morning. My name is Courtney Kemp, and I'm from Jonesville, Louisiana. My husband is Roy White Kemp, one of the 11 men killed on the Deepwater Horizon oil rig that exploded on April 20th, 2010. On behalf of my husband and my family, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to speak with you regarding issues in the oil and gas industry. My husband and I have two precious daughters, Kaylee three and Madison four months. Our girls will only know what a wonderful father they had by the stories we tell them. While I understand companies must make a profit, I do not believe it should be at the expense of risking lives or destroying families. I am asking you to please consider harsh punishments on companies who choose to ignore safety standards before other families are destroyed. I'm not here today to suggest that Congress implement more safety regulations, but rather to encourage you to hold companies accountable for safety regulations already in place and merely neglected. If proper safety procedures had been taken on the Deepwater Horizon, it is my firm belief that this tragic accident would have been prevented and my husband and the others would be alive today. It is no secret that the oil spill has affected the environment. One can see the devastation that is happening to the coastline and the magnitude of its effects on the seafood industry in general. However, our state has overcome many adversities in the past, including numerous weather-related issues such as hurricanes and droughts. We as Americans are a strong people and will recover from this tragedy as well. America is a rich nation regarding natural resources, but in my opinion, we have become too dependent upon foreign imports, this including oil. While we realize we are suffering from economic impacts resulting from the leaking oil, it would be even more devastating if you allow drilling in the Gulf to cease. <coughs> if drilling ceases, not only would offshore employees lose their jobs, but the trickle-down effect would be devastating not only to the coastal states, but eventually the entire country. You must not allow this to happen. Drilling in the Gulf must continue. I would also like to speak with the members of Congress about one of the many acts of Congress that may have a negative effect on my family's future. The Death on the High Seas Act is an antiquated act of Congress passed in 1920, which spells out the losses that the family of a person who suffers wrongful death on the high seas may recover. DOSHA is a comprehensive act that limits allowable damages for deaths occurring on the high seas. This act does not permit 
the applications of strong wrongful death remedies. It does not look to general maritime law to, sim su to supplement the act's limitations. In essence, the act limits the liabilities of wrongdoers in this matter, such as BP, Transocean, and many others. My family can never and will never be adequately compensated for our loss. What I am seeking is accountability from the wrongdoers who caused this terrible tragedy. I ask that the members of Congress use this catastrophe as a basis to revisit and amend this outdated act from 1920, revise DOSHA with 21st century standards and realities in mind. Please use this opportunity to make corporate America more responsible and accountable. Require corporate wrongdoers to fully, fairly, and adequately compensate the victims of senseless accidents. Thank you. Thank you and thank you both for your testimony. Let me ask a question or two, if I may. We'll start with questions from members. Uh, our investigation has uncovered several flaws in the design and operations of this well, including equipment malfunctions. From our investigation, we've learned that BP and Transocean were not prepared for a catastrophic loss of well control on the Deepwater Horizon, like the one that occurred on April 20th. We've learned of the following problems, among many, but some of the more obvious ones are Mechanical problems were uncovered as early as March of 2010. The blow-up preventer, which is the fail-safe tool designed to prevent a catastrophic loss of control, was not maintained properly and it was not fully tested. It appears BP made well-designed choices that may have compromised safety. According to BP's preliminary investigation, there were several signs of possible loss of well control in the 24 hours before the explosion yet steps were not taken to safeguard the employees. It also appears BP made several cementing design choices that went against the best practices for the industry. This weekend we see ads from BP like this, one we have here. And I point that out because it says, we will get it done, we'll make this right. Reminds me of the marshes we were in last night. Once the oil gets in those marshes, you really can't get them out. Mother Nature has to do that. But more importantly, it can't make your loss right. And the part that disturbs me, the ad never mentions your loss. The ad of the 11 people who died and, and those who were injured. So let me ask you this, Natalie and Courtney. What would you ask these companies, BP and Transocean? What would you ask them if you had the opportunity? Hopefully you can do it through us. Ms. Rosto? If I had the opportunity to ask VP one question, it would be, I know that my husband can't come back. There's nothing I can do or say to make him come back. But why? What went wrong? Why weren't you out there trying to do something in the weeks before when they were having problems? Ms. Kemp? I would also ask why, but in a different sense. Why is it that money is more important than someone's life? Why? And I'm extremely upset that BP has never mentioned the 11 or the ones that are injured or the men that are struggling mentally that survived that tragic night. Okay. Um, through this hearing, you mentioned the Death on the High Seas Act, I'm sure every member here took note of it, and, and we'll look at it as the Congress of the United States. I'm sure the whole Congress will. Um, what other hopes do you have this hearing will accomplish? What else would you like to see come from these hearings? You mentioned safety. You mentioned the High Seas Act. Anything else you'd like to see? Ms. Kent, Ms. Rashto? I'm afraid to ask your counsel because I'm sure they have a list of them for us. But uh, My hope from this hearing is to not stop offshore drilling. That's, that has, when I saw that and heard that, that hit deep because my husband took great pride in his job. And many men, many men depend on offshore drilling. 
that is our way of life. I mean, I, that, that would not do these men any justice one bit. I totally agree with Natalie's statement in that our husbands will, being a Christian, we will one day again say our husbands. But it is important now that Congress and the government in itself takes takes pride in knowing that there are men out there that work every day to put fuel in your vehicles, to heat our homes, and that is something that is merely, merely neglected. And I hope today that people realize how important offshore drilling is and how important it is not only to the coastal states where so many people work because we do live in very rural areas and offshore work is a way for families to make a living and to be able to provide for children. And I hope that you work very hard and diligently to make sure that drilling continues in the Gulf. Well, I can't speak for all the members, but uh, from where I sit, uh, the <laughs> drilling will continue right now after this tragic accident. I think we need a pause here. Let's see what went wrong. Let's make sure it doesn't happen again, whether it's a shallow well or a deep water well. Let's make sure we get it right. We can't have more hearings like this with uh, young folks like you coming, talking about your tragic loss and the environment being devastated in the Gulf. So I, I think we ought to slow it down for a minute here. Let's see what's going on. Uh, let's get uh, proper rules and regulations, safety concerns addressed, and I think there will always be drilling in the outer, con outer continental shelf or wherever in this country. We just got to do it better, safer. With that, uh, I went my questions. We're going to go, this will be the order of questioning so all members know. Mr. Burgess would go next, Mr. Braley, Mr. Markey, Ms. DeGette, Ms. Schakowsky, Ms. Christensen, Mr. Malonsong, Mr. Scalise. Mr. Burgess, five minutes, please. Thank you, Chairman. And I, again, I want to thank our witnesses for being here today. I want to thank you for bringing to our attention Chapter 21, Paragraph 761 of the Death of the High Seas Act. You know, it's interesting, we've been talking about changing the law where BP's liability is capped at $75 million to $10 billion, but, but that actually wouldn't help what you're talking about on the Death of the High Seas Act where no, uh, no liability if it occurs beyond three miles out from, from the shore. And clearly, as we, as we adjust uh, for the 21st century, the, the liability of the companies, this is something that on an individual basis has to be tackled also. So just to let you know, your testimony here this morning has been very helpful. Let me, uh, let me ask you a question. What, now, your, did your husbands work for BP or Transocean or Halliburton? Transocean. 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 And uh, since the accident, what have you heard from the company itself? Have they come to you and, and offered uh, any type of assistance with, uh, with pulling your lives back together? Actually, I sat across my kitchen table with the CEO and president of Transocean. He personally paid a visit to me. And um, I also have a lady from the company that has kept in close contact with me about anything to do with anything out there. So are they giving you financial assistance at this point? Um, yes, I, we're still receiving his paycheck until otherwise. I see. And, and same with you, Ms. Kemp? Yes, sir. Um, again, Mr. Steve Newman, the CEO of the company, came to the house um, to express his personal condolences. Um, like Natalie, I also have a representative from Transocean who we keep in close contact and she and I speak regularly on a daily basis. Um, and yes, we are can, still receiving their paychecks just if, if they were out there working. I see. So, so the ability to keep body and soul together right now while things are being sorted out, you have a cash flow that is, that is available to you? Yes, sir. Yes. And, and the reason I ask is because, you know, just preceding the, uh, the Deepwater Horizon tragedy, there was another tragedy that occurred on land on April 5th in West Virginia. And uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll submit this for the record, but a, a newspaper article on the Upper Big Branch mine, each miner's spouse or beneficiary will collect life insurance benefits that are five times the miner's annual pay. 
a surviving spouse will be entitled to 20 years of health benefits. Dependent children will continue health benefits until age 19 or age 24. Child care benefit for children up to the age of 12. It, uh, this company obviously got out in front of this issue. I, I'm glad to hear that Transocean did. I actually don't know if any of BP's employees were, were killed in the accident, and I'd be interested to know if, if they have been as forthcoming. But clearly, um, this is not, this, in my opinion, this is preventive medicine. This is taking care of a family that needs help who suffered a devastating loss. I'm glad to hear that the Transocean has, has stepped up. Um, I, I, I hope that it is uh, every bit as reasonable as what the, uh, the owners of the Upper Big Branch Mine did because they clearly recognized they were facing a dreadful public relations problem, as is Transocean, as is BP, um, and honestly, as is Halliburton. Did your husbands talk to you at all? You, both of you referenced the fact that, that w when you saw your husbands, they talked about things that were not right on the rig. I presume you've talked to the Coast Guard about this, but is there anything you can share with us about the stories your husbands were telling you the, uh, during those last visits about concerns they had about safety on the rig? Um, the last time Shane was home, the three weeks he was home, um, we had some pretty detailed conversations about some of the issues out there concerning the well. Um, I'm going to stop you for just a second. Was that, is that normal Coast side conversation that you and Shane would have had? We had or was he overly concerned about no, safety? No, no. We always talked about his work. I had an intense interest in his work because I did not work. Um, because I couldn't see it with my own two eyes, I had a lot of questions. And um, I mean, the four and a half years he was out there, we talked 90% about his work. And um, because he was moving up and he was really interested in his job. But um, we had some previous conversations on some issues that they had out there. Um, main reason he had an issue was because he was working in the mud room, a lot of mud balls, undoubtedly. Um, I actually spoke with him at 1.30 um, the morning of the accident. And um, he expressed some concern about some issues they were having. And um, I talked to him at 10.30 the a.m. the morning of the accident and um, the t at that time he didn't really express any concern but at our 1.30 a.m. conversation he had some concerns about some well issues that they were having, the mud loss. Ms. Kemp, just in the little time I have left, can you respond to that? Yes, um, my husband also stated that um, they had been losing mud, the, they had had uh, problems with well control before. Um, and actually lost the well and lost a lot of tools and everything, um, several millions of dollars worth of equipment that had been lost. They were also receiving a lot of kicks from the well, a lot of gas pressure, and, um, and that had been going on throughout the duration of this well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Bra Braley, for questions, please. Thank you. And uh, Ms. Rashto, Ms. Kemp, I want to thank you for bringing up this problem with the Jones Act, otherwise known as the Death on the High Seas Act, because a lot of people don't appreciate what's going on out on those drilling platforms. They don't know that they are flagged vessels and that the Deepwater Horizon rig was flagged as a vessel in the Marshall Islands. Were you aware of that? Uh, no, I was not. And that because they are a flagged vessel, they are subject to the uh, Jones Act limitations, which are very restrictive. They don't provide any compensation for quality of life damages, for the loss, the emotional loss that the two of you have, for, for losing your husband, for the emotional loss that your children have, for the fact that your husband won't be there for their high school graduations, or their weddings, or those wonderful times that families get to celebrate if this had happened on land under the laws of Louisiana and almost every other state, your claims would have been significantly greater and different because those quality of life damages are recognized, but they're not under the federal law known as the Jones Act. And that's the concern both of you were expressing. Is that what you were sharing with the committee? Yes. Okay. Now, one of the things that we do know is that <coughs> Transocean was involved in reaching out to families after this disaster occurred. And Ms. Rostow, you talked about being contacted, I think it was, you said six o'clock in the morning by phone call? 
Um, actually, my mother woke me up. Um, she had gotten a phone call from a friend of a friend that was on another rig. I actually did not hear from Translation until 11.22 that afternoon to ask if it was a good contact number. And then I t again talked to him at 2.20, and they did not confirm that he was on the missing list till around 4, so when I was already in Fouchon. Can you just tell us the extent of your contact with a representative from Transocean as you went through that difficult first period? Um, are you talking like the first day? Yes. Um, the first day, I, st I spoke with them periodically, every, pretty much every hour, but it was this after 11 is when I spoke with them pretty much every hour, but um, it was never any new information. Um, like I said, I didn't actually find out he was on the missing list until around 4. Um, my mom actually is the one that woke me up and told me I had heard that there was some in different hospitals that had already been contacted. I actually contacted different hospitals that I'd heard some were at. Um, we made it down to Port Fouchon. We stayed down there, and that's where we found out the boat was supposed to be coming in, went to where the seaport where the boat was supposed to be coming in, and that's about the time that I found out he was on the missing list. And when you talk about the boat coming in, are you referring to the crew the, boat that was carrying the men, the survivors? Bringing the survivors mm -hmm. back to shore. What were you told, if anything, about the circumstances that had led to this disaster? At that point, at the seaport, um, I really didn't know much. I knew what I had watched at the 3 o'clock news conference on the TV. That was the extent. Um, at 3 o'clock, when I watched the news conference, that was the most news the most information I'd heard then. The only thing I knew up till that point was that there had been an explosion. When was the first time you had contact <laughs> with anyone from Transocean that gave you some sense of explanation of what had happened to your husband? Never, never. And so to this day, you've never received an explanation? No. no. Okay. And Ms. Kemp, I see you also responding. Tell us what your experience was like in dealing with Transocean. Um, I received a call at approximately 4.30 on April 21st. Um, the lady told me that there had been an explosion on the Deepwater Horizon and an emergency evacuation was taking place and the Coast Guard was on the scene. Um, I immediately jumped to my feet and said, where is my husband? And she said, at this time, we don't know. And I said, can you tell me anything about him, anything about the crew? No, ma'am, we don't have any information. I said, okay. Um, I took her name, her phone number, and I said that I would be contacting you. Um, I then, about 6 o'clock that morning, I called um, Wyatt, rode back and forth with Wyman Wheeler, and I called his home, and Becky was already en route to New Orleans, his wife, to... Uh, he was one of the ones injured. And I asked, I said, where is Wyatt? What, you know, what's going on? And she said, Wyman doesn't know where anybody is. I don't have a clue. When I get down there, I'll try to find out something for you and get back with you. Um, they, Transocean set up a hotline. I started calling the hotline every hour on the hour. And when I did, around 2 o'clock, um, Someone answered the hotline and told me that everyone had been accounted for and no fatalities were reported. At that was 2 o'clock the first day? 2 o'clock the first day, April 21st. At uh, approximately 2.30, my uh, sheriff in our parish came to the house. He is a personal friend of ours. He came to the house and he told me, he said, Courtney, let's go in this room and I, I need you to call this lady. And um, so I did so. And that's when she informed me that Watt was one of the 11 missing. And to, to this day, we have never received any kind of explanation as to what happened. There's a lot of speculation, a lot of things you hear, but we have never gotten an explanation from Transocean BP, anybody. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bradley. Mr. Markey, for questions, please. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman, very much. Um, and thank you for your uh, testimony. It's very important for us to hear how our laws and how they're implemented impact ordinary families. So the first thing I would like to tell you is that uh, your testimony is going to help to make it possible for us to repeal the death 
on the High Seas Act uh, so that uh, we never again have a situation like this. Uh, we have thousands and thousands of people who are out on these rigs out on the ocean and there never was any intention um, for you and people like you not to be able to recover for your family. So that has to be changed and your testimony is going to very profoundly help us to be able to accomplish that goal. Now you talked a little bit about the concerns which your husband had about mud control, about well control. Was he concerned about the um, shortcuts that BP was making and safety out on the rig, Ms. Rashna? Um, Shane never made any reference to BP as far as safety. Um, the last time Shane was home, we actually he actually attended a safety school that Transocean put on, and um, he highly spoke of Transocean and their safety. Now there were um, statements made that there was times he felt that there was agendas put over safety, you know, business agendas to get the work done. Um, the last, when I spoke with him in the weeks before, the first week he was out there before the accident, um, there was t talk about high pressure and how they were pushing them to get finished because, you know, they were over budget and they were over their time on the whole. And um, yes, there was concerns, but never anything pointed towards BP or Transocean. What would you say to BP about the impact that compromises in safety have upon families when something goes tragically wrong? Um, let's just remember that it's it's all going to be okay in the end. You're going to get that all out of that hole regardless of how long it takes. But there were 11 men that suffered, 11 families that suffered, and Let's not place the importance of all over the importance of a life. Thank you, Ms. Sasha. What would you say to BP about the compromise of safety and the pursuit of oil? Um, again, like Natalie, I, I don't see how, you know, people say money is the root of all evil. And uh, in this case, it really was. Um, BP, it, it, it's plain to see that, of course, BP was in a hurry because they were over schedule um, and, of course, trying to hurry up and get off of that well and move on to the next one. Um, so in, in a way, it's just the fact that life is way too precious and no amount of money will ever be sufficient of bringing your, your spouse back or your father back. or or anything like that. And frankly, it's not that important um, as far as a, of you're talking about a life. Well, the one way that we can hurt BP is to make sure that BP stands for bills paid, that the money for families, the money to clean up the Gulf comes out of their pocket. Uh, and that we repeal the Death on the High Seas Act uh, and we change the laws in order to make sure that these companies are more accountable uh, when they harm not only lives but the livelihoods of people I uh, really, who are dependent upon these companies. I'm sorry. No, please. Um, I really believe that BP will never understand the pain that we feel. And the only way that big companies like that will feel the pain is when it comes out of their pocket. Because that's basically how we have felt it is all that they're worried about. And until they're hurt bad enough, they will never understand what we are going through. And even if they are hurt bad enough, they still will never understand the pain we feel. Well, we are going to make sure that they feel the pain. And the two of you will always be remembered as we uh, go back to Washington. And if we'll, you can do that, this will, this will serve justice to all 11 men. If you can do that, this will make all the pain, I can speak for Courtney too, and all the suffering worth every bit of this, just to see something change out there. 
Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Mr. Get, for questions, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Ms. Rushto, uh, you talked in your in your testimony today and also in your written testimony about the safety schools, meetings, fire drills, and safety regulations that your husband, Shane, went through. Uh, did you feel like he was really thoroughly trained about emergency procedures on the rig? What would happen? Yes and no. Um, Every Sunday, especially the last Sunday before he would come home on Wednesday, he would always say, last safety, I mean, last fire drill, baby, I gotta go. Um, they practiced, 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 um, evacuation drills and that kind of stuff. Um, but throughout all this, I've learned that, and I also knew it was at 10 o'clock every Sunday. That's exactly, it was at the same time, every Sunday, same place. If there can be something different done as far as maybe under different conditions <coughs> or um, different ways of going about it each time, you can practice, practice, and you can do it. But when it really comes down to it like it did the night of April 20th, it all goes out of wash in an in a incident like that. If there could be something done different to make them in different situations, so they were trying to do one thing, but maybe not respond to a situation like this. That's right, what you're saying. Right. Ms. Kemp, what about your husband, Wyatt? Uh, yes, yes and no. Um, they were they were trained. They were um, they were made to do things and and go through different trainings and all of that. And all of that was great. Um, and then Wyatt would say, you know, some helped and some didn't. <laughs> but um, but at at this catastrophe. The magnitude of this accident, it from what to some of the crew members and everything, all of their safety plans, all of their you know fire safety drills, all that went out the window. Yeah. They were not they were not expecting something of this magnitude to happen. Yeah, you're talking about a blast that that threw the the axes off the window, broke them in half. There was things there that they couldn't do anything to help the other people and because they were not expecting a blast like this. One, one of the things that we've, so, so the answer, and, and Ms. Rashta said this in her testimony, it's not more training, it's better training and more focused training. Right. Right. One of the things we've seen in the news accounts is a criticism that there wasn't any real chain of command. There was this pressure, both of you talked about it, there was this pressure to get things done. There, and a lot of people had concerns, the mud concerns, the gas build up, the hurry up. Um, and we've seen that from you and other people. But what they're saying is no one was really sure exactly who they could go to and talk to about those concerns and get those concerns addressed. Did your husbands talk to you about that, Ms. Rashto, about, about a lack of a, of a place uh, of a sort of a system in place that, to address that? Shane was fully aware of the chain of command and who, if he had a problem, who to go to. Now, from the testimonies and different things I've heard from that night, there was a mix up or, you know, who should have been in command, who should have made what call. Um, I think that should be addressed because it is a dynamically positioned rig and you do have an OIM and you do have a captain that needs to be a fine definition of who is in charge, who makes what call, in what situation. Mm -hmm. Ms. Kemp, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, I agree with Natalie's statement in that, you know, my husband knew who to go to personally, but in something uh, this horrific, it like I said, it all went out the window. Do you, um, do you know if your husband felt like he could go to people and talk about this gas buildup that you mentioned and have it addressed, or was it just sort of a fact that he was reporting? Um, it was more of a fact that he was reporting. Uh -huh. um, I know, I feel certain that he and Wyman talked about it, Wyman Wheeler, um, because they were traveling partners. Wyman is also a tool pusher, so in, as far as the chain of command goes, he is above what? And um, so I'm sure that they, they spoke about it and everything. Yeah. Um, but to what extent, I'm not sure. You know, this is one of the things we're hearing about is uh, everybody knew about these problems, but nobody, but there was a chain of command, but nobody 
felt nobody could could stop it or slow it down or make, you know what I'm saying? They they knew there were problems, but they were just sort of going told to go along and do their job. I know about smaller issues the men um, could report and not feel that there was any way of losing their job because in um, <coughs> in 2008, no, yeah, 2008, my husband received an award for spotting a dropped object, but that was within transaction. That was not within VP. So I think within the company translation and the men on his rig, Shane always felt like if there was an issue, he could express it to his Transocean fellow co-workers, but never once did he ever make a statement to, to me about feeling comfortable about speaking with BP or you know, if he did speak a concern with Transocean, did they ever follow up with BP? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Oh, Thank you. Can, can, can Ms. Kemp answer real quick? Yes. She wanted to. Um, also, with my husband, you know, BP company men are, they're the ones who call the shots as their well. But as far as with the rig and everything with Transocean, my husband was willing and able and, and, and could go and speak to Transocean members. But as far as with BP, it was not like that because they called the shots. Thank you. Ms. Schakowsky for questions, please. Thank you so much. Let me follow up on, on that. There was uh, talk about pressure because it was, uh, the, the, the project was being rushed to, to be finished. Um, did that um, pressure come from BP to Transocean or was that just internally Transocean? In other words, did the Transocean employees feel like they were being pressured by BP to complete the job? Do you have any sense of that? Um, I, not really sense of it, but I believe, you know, that that was, that was the extent. BP was, you know, in a crunch and they were behind on the well and everything and they had fallen behind schedule. So I think, I know speaking for Watt, that he was pressured and trying to hurry up and get things done. And, and that pressure would have come from his, from his bosses, but he felt that it was really a BP that pressured Transocean to get it done. I'm trying to understand who might have short-circuited a little bit and what the cause of that would have been in terms of safety. Um, I think it was a trickle effect. I think it was a trickle yeah, effect. Yeah, it was a trickle all. effect. I can't hear you. Uh, I said I think it was a trickle effect. I see. It, I mean, came from the well holders and then, I mean, Transition knew that they were their well holders and that was their contract. That's how they pay their men on that rig. I think it was a trickle effect. Was any of the slowdown, it was a difficult well, I think both of you have mentioned, but um, was um, any of the slowdown uh, particularly identified as things that would affect safety? When they were losing tools in the hole and had to go back and drill a side drill because they had lost the hole. I mean, this is, we're talking about the same hole that in 05 they, were, they abandoned for the same issues. But yet they put the Deepwater Horizon rig over this hole and yet we're still having problems in the first two weeks that they got over this hole. Um, see, they yeah. lost the well and had to drill a relief well beside it. Got it. Um, has um, Transocean ever made any statements to you or assurances about financial compensation that your families would be all right? You said that they're right now paying salaries, but did they, they ever really talk to you about the future? They have come to me and um, made a settlement offer, but it's um, not enough. Okay. We spoke, but nothing of serious nature. And, and what about um, BP? What kind of contact have you had with uh, British Petroleum um, since, since the incident? Letters, phone calls, um, visits? Two BP men attended Shane Services and they, um, they never extended a hand, a, hu a hug, um, never extended a we're sorry, their condolences. The only words that came out of their mouth was where may we be seated. And I never saw them after that. 
They said they asked you that. They came right up to you and asked that. They, I met them, were greeting at the door at Shane yes. Services. And um, I never saw them after that. And I have not spoke with one. And, and what about you, uh, Ms. Kemp? Uh, two, BB, do, two BP men came to uh, White Services and one uh, extended his hand. I shook it. He told me that he was sorry for my loss. He asked if he could hug me. He did. The other gentleman extended his hand, told me who he was, and they sent two plants to the services. And that is the extent of my conversation or any dealings with BP. Did they identify themselves as, to, I'm not looking for names, but as to high up they, how high up they were in the company in any way? No, ma'am. Uh -huh. um, was there ever an, any indication from either of your husbands that there was a tension with, uh, b between Transocean and BP, that different instructions somehow were, uh, were, were coming down, that there was um, any feeling that BP wasn't doing what it should do? Was, was there any, ever any of that? My husband never spoke of, spoke of that. No, no ma'am. Okay. So uh, aside from your, both of your feeling that we should uh, repeal the, uh, what's it called, Oceans Death, Death, Death on the High Seas, seas uh, Act, um, you feel like, it, it sounds like you don't think that there needs to be new legislation, but rather enforcement, is, is that right? Is there anything else that you would think we ought to do in order to prevent this in the future? I think uh, that there are plenty of safety regulations in place. It's just the mere fact of them being enforced and not being neglected and having some accountability for when they are neglected. Yes, I, I fully agree with Courtney. I think that there should somehow be a way to make these companies um, have to be looked at by maybe a third party to come in and investigate, maybe say this safety rule's good, you have this backup plan, but let's revise this backup plan because if they're regulating themselves, how do we know if they're doing it the right way or the wrong way? Undoubtedly, it was the wrong way in this situation. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Christensen, for questions, please. And thank you for being here. And Ms. Kemp, um, I understand that White worked for Transocean for four years prior to the explosion, and we know that he was a hard-working individual, and uh, he had recently been promoted to assistant driller. Um, did he work on the deep water horizon for all of those four years? Uh, yes, ma'am. Actually, oh, he worked a little more than four years. Um, okay. It was approximately four and a half, five years, and he had only worked on the deep water horizon. Oh, okay. Because my question was going to be then, how did, would he have compared that to other sites? So I, I, I guess I'll... He had worked on a land rig, but not in the Gulf. Okay. And Ms. Rashto, uh, your husband, also a very hard worker, was training to work at the subsea level. He had worked also for four years? Yes, At Transocean? Mm -hmm. um, did... It, both of you had testified that your husband spoke to you about the difficulties, the mud leaking, and maybe and the loss of equipment and so forth. Um, did Shane work on any other projects that he would be able to have compared? No, he to? didn't. But um, the day he got hired, he got the phone call from Transocean, and he called the guy that actually got him hired. Um, the guy told him he also worked for Transocean. He said, "If there's any rig that you want to be on, it's the Deepwater Horizon." He said that is by far the safest rig in the Gulf. Well, did any of them, I'm trying to get a sense, of my, the um, purpose of my question was to try to get a sense if the difficulties that were being experienced on this, in this operation were different from others. Did, in their um, maybe discussions with other workers on uh, this deep water uh, operation, did you ever get a sense that the difficulties that they were experiencing were different or greater than might have happened, uh, might have been experienced by their coworkers who worked on other rigs? Why would always, why just told me that, you know, it was 
it was typical to, to get some kicks from a whale and to have some problems, but it was their job to deal with the problems, fix them, and go on with it. This whale was different in the fact that they were having so many problems and so many things were happening, and it was just kind of out of hand. And that was your sense also? Um, the numerous kickbacks that they were having and the loss of the whale is what really concerned Shane and the loss of mud because he had never worked in it before. That was his three main concerns, you know, that we talked about a lot. Okay, well, um, although a lot of information is being uncovered, there's still a lot that we don't know. But I think you can um, walk away from this hearing with assurances that this subcommittee, uh, as it does in every instance, will not let up until all the questions are answered and we know what happened and, and who's responsible. But again, thank you for being here and honoring the lives of your husbands uh, with your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lonsong, for questions, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, on a bright note, uh, I've spent many a hunting season in Liberty, Mississippi. We <laughs> hunted about six miles north on the Macomb Highway when I was in college and several years after. So um, if Shane was a hunter and fisherman and if why it was too, I understand. And Jonesville's a good hunting area and fishing area. And uh, uh, so uh, I, they're probably guys I would have had a lot to talk about with. Um, the death on the high seas thing, bothers me tremendously um, and just so you'll know I will support and work to try and make sure that we repeal or reform that section of law it's it's egregious that there is no recourse other than I think the only obligation that the company has is to reimburse you for a funeral uh, and I think that's it I may be wrong so that's that's very disheartening it's it's uh, in these days and times, and even back in those days and times, it probably shouldn't have been. Did, did Transocean advise either of you um, how long they intended to continue giving you your husband's checks? And are they going to continue health benefits? or? Um, I know until the life insurance is, is issued, we will receive his paycheck. But now, as far as um, health insurance, no, we have not spoke on that matter. Okay, have they we have touched on the health insurance part, and um, it is my understanding until a settlement is reached, we will be uh, compensated with health insurance. And um, up to uh, a year after the settlement, we can receive health insurance, but we have to pay for it at the company rate. And then after that year, we're on our own. Now, the life insurance, is that a company benefit or this life insurance that your husband's and y'all purchased? It's a company it's benefit. A company benefit. It is a company benefit. Mm -hmm. Um, is it adequate to maintain your family for, I mean, we don't know how long that might be the rest of your um, life. I wouldn't, I would say so because, um, last year when the Deepwater Horizon started to take on water and they had a, a problem or whatever, Shane came home and said that. He realized that he was working in a very dangerous atmosphere and it just really him, opened his eyes up and we actually purchased some. You purchased more. Um, not purchased, but through the company, we took out some extra insurance plans because uh, he said he but wanted. You, still, you had to pay for those yourself. That no, they no. came out of his check and Anything. things like that, but it was at the company's expense. Okay. But um, now regularly, if you just take what the company offers and don't take an extra plan, I wouldn't say that it's compensatable. No, um, and, and we just, we took what the company planned. Okay. There has been, I have heard, don't know if it's fact or not, and I don't know if either of your husbands had a conversation, but as I understand it, Slumberjay was on the rig prior to the explosion and about 11 hours out said they were getting off the rig. Um, is, did either of your husbands have a conversation with you about that? or? Uh, my husband did not, but I am aware of Slumber Day being out there. That's yeah. saying that they felt it was an unsafe condition and it was... Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Um, my father is close friends with someone who worked for Slumber Day and he told my dad. I mean, would you think that your husband's of course, they can say to the Transocean people, if they're getting off, then maybe there's a problem. We ought to be 
Yeah, let's let's follow in behind. <laughs> yeah, I mean they should have been putting them on the same crew boat or the same helicopter, if in fact that was, and maybe leave a skeleton crew to try and seaman in the hole or whatever the procedure would be there. But um, did did either one of them? Did when you talk? Did y'all talk to them that afternoon? In that period of time, uh, that they may have said something about Slumberjay pulling off. My husband never talked to me about Slumberjay. Yeah. Uh, I, I work in a in a dangerous job as well, and um, he didn't want. I, I don't think he wanted to bother me he didn't about it. He didn't want you it. worried. Sorry. He didn't want you worried. <laughs> right. <laughs> and what What do you do? I'm an investigator for child protection. Okay. Sheriff's office. Uh, or DA's office. No, sir, with the Department of Social Services. Okay, yeah, you can get some hairy situations. Um, the, uh, one of the things that, and, and, and I'm to the committee, uh, this lady's from Mississippi, this lady's from North Louisiana. Uh, I think if we look at the residencies of the people on the rig, we've probably got Mississippi, Arkansas, Alabama, Tennessee, te you name it. They're everywhere. Um, they're from everywhere. Um, so this is one rig and all of them like that that touch families from throughout the South um, as best I can tell. Um, I support drilling. I'm just hoping that we can find something between shutting down and drill baby drill to give us the balance, to maintain the economy, to provide the good jobs, but at the same time we need to make sure this never happens to anyone again and safety should be our first priority and um, the committee and I thank the chairman and the ranking member uh, that's where I will work to try and make sure that when you go to work the expectation is that you'll be coming back from work. Right. So thank you all again for yeah, Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you Mr. Melanson. Mr. Scalise for questions please five minutes. Thank you Mr. Chairman. You both talked about the safety regulations uh, you know, I guess the, whether there should be more regulation to just follow the existing, and I think both uh, Ms. Rossman and Ms. Kemp both said that maybe it's more of a case that the existing safety regulations weren't followed uh, more, than, more than we need more. Can you both touch on, were there things that you saw in, in conversations you had with your husbands about uh, safety regulations that weren't being followed or how the regulations weren't being properly administered by the federal regulator. What, what, what things did you see that to make you feel that way? I didn't speak to my husband about uh, safety regulations, uh, particularly on this well, uh, but I, I didn't learn about all of the shortcuts and everything that was taking place until after the explosion. In conversations with some of the other families? Or? Correct. Uh, with conversations with some of the other crew members, uh, and just things that have come out in the media and everything. Um, looking back on Shane and I's um, past conversations, the weeks leading up to the accident when he was on the rig, um, I never thought about it. When we were talking about it, I never thought about the, um, I guess really the problems that they were having and what, how it could end up. But um, when I found out and as I had conversations with the crew members and I thought about what he said, it really made me realize that there was a problem. And he saw it. He knew that there was a problem. Now as far as safety on this particular rig, he never specifically pinpointed a safety issue that they had, but um, he did make reference to safety. You know, that was in practice. Um, he was always very prideful about Transocean and how they practice safety, but never, it was always Transocean practice safety, never BP practice safety. Um, but he always was very prideful in Transocean practicing safety. But at the same time, though, there were downfalls to their safety, different ways they went about doing safety things. and. Um, Think cards and permits they had to get. There was issues with that, not necessarily just on this well, but on his time on the Deepwater Horizon. I've heard some stories, mostly secondhand accounts, that there may have been some pretty strong disagreements between uh, some of the, the Transocean people on the rig and BP, uh, especially about the displacement of the mud uh, when they brought in water and during the ceiling period, and maybe there was a disagreement 
which procedure to use. So we had a hearing with Transocean and BP, and, and they said there wasn't a disagreement, but we're hearing that, that there were employees, and I don't know if y'all have heard of any of those, but there, were, there was a pretty strong disagreement over the process that was used to displace the, the mine with water. I've heard that from some of the crew members um, who, uh, one in particular that, that walked in and they were, uh, BP and Transocean were going back and forth on what was supposed to take place that day and, um, and about the displacement of the mud with seawater. And um, I, I think it was a kind of a heated conversation. It's the same thing I heard. Did y'all ever hear, your husbands ever share stories of the MMS, the federal regulator, uh, coming on to the regular inspection, was it all, did they just kind of cede that responsibility to the company to do their own inspection? Do you know? I've learned more about MMS in the past weeks than I ever knew about them. Because there's some talks, one of the answers is splitting them up, and, and it seems like if you've got an agency of over 1,700 people, whether it's one agency or three, one agency wasn't doing its job, having three agencies not doing its job doesn't seem to accomplish anything, but I don't know if y'all have heard is that something else that we'll be looking at? I think something you said earlier, it's more like a case of just doing doing your job right as opposed to not doing the proper inspections. Uh, whether you're for big government or small government, I think we should all be able to expect competent government. And I don't know if we got that here. And so that's something else we've got to look into on our side to make sure that for other families, as you talk about, uh, that, that they don't have to worry about things like that in the future. And then one last thing, and you, you both talked about what the industry means to your lives and, and you know, what it meant to your families, and, you know, how much your husband, the pride that they had. I know it's being talked about what to deal with in terms of policy, possibly, of this, this potential shutdown of man that, that in essence would run all of these rigs uh, off for maybe three to five years or more because of the infrastructure. And y'all shared just what the industry really means in terms of um, what it meant to my family was being able to put a roof over my child's head. I attended college. I had every intention of, um, I was actually supposed to graduate May the 13th. I had to take an incomplete because of the incident. Um, I had, Shane had every full intention of putting me through school to get my master's. And um, we, what it meant to us was a way to provide for our child a way to provide a lifestyle that most 21 and 22 year old people cannot provide for their child because everyone knows sitting in this room that offshore you make more money than you do on land. It's just a fact of it. But at the same time though, it meant being able to come home and spend three weeks every day with his family. Most people don't get but the weekends, whereas our husbands received three weeks of, with us every single day doing what we wanted. Um, in, back in, in my town, in my part of Louisiana, you, you can walk down the street and you can ask somebody, what do you do for a living? 75% to 80% of them will say they work offshore. Or they know somebody that works offshore. Or they know somebody that works for Transocean. Um, the oil field industry is, is a very, very large industry in our state and with the coastal states, um, especially in my hometown. Um, and like Natalie said, it's, it's one that my husband could go out there, make good money, and be at home with me and the girls and, and give us his, his devoted time. Now, you know, Mr. Melanson talked about hunting, and, and I had to share that with my husband but because um, he, he enjoyed his fair share of hunting. But... Um, but that was definitely, um, definitely one thing that he enjoyed um, was the time at home with his family that he didn't have to worry about the rig or he didn't have to worry about work. And, um, and one thing that, that we all really enjoyed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank both of you. I was a father of a three-year-old and a one-year-old. I, I can't imagine uh, you know, what it's like, but I, I can say I appreciate the strength that both of you uh, exhibit. If there's anything I want to do to help you along the way, but thank you so much for your testimony. We'd like to thank you again for your testimony. Let me just uh, ask you for your counsel. You both indicated you had counsel. We know Transocean's asked for a $17 million cap 
uh, we'd like your counsel to just to uh, explain to us how the Jones Act, whether that would be part of it and affect it, because uh, you certainly raise the awareness of the committee on that issue, and I think we would like a full uh, explanation as, as we move forward to try to uh, amend that act, at least to try to assist here. So if your attorneys would, your counsel would uh, give us some insight on that, uh, especially with that cap sitting out there, we'd like to know more about it. And we would use it to supplement the record since there's been many questions from members on that particular act. Okay? Thank you. We'll dismiss you and thank you again for your courage, for your testimony, and if you feel free to, to stay if you'd like uh, for the rest of the hearing. Thank you both. I'd now like to call up our second panel of witnesses. On our second panel, we have Ms. Wilma Sobra, who is a chemist that provides technical assistance to the Louisiana Environmental Action Network. She has extensive knowledge on the human health and environmental effects associated with the spill. Mr. Ronnie Duplissis, who is an oyster and shrimp fisherman from Devant, Louisiana. Ronnie's shrimping grounds and oyster beds have been closed, putting him out of work. Mr. Kelby Lynn, who is president of ACP Real Estate, a beachfront property sale and rental agency on Dolphin Island, Alabama. And Dr. Moby Solange, who is founder, president, and executive director of the Institute for Marine Mammal Studies in Gulfport, Mississippi. Dr. Solange has studied and written on the effects of Louisiana crude oil on fisheries. As with the last panel, it's the policy of this subcommittee to take all testimony under oath. Please be advised that you have the right under the rules of the House to be advised by counsel during your testimony. Do any of you wish to be represented by counsel? No. Nope. Everyone's shaking their heads no, so uh, great. And let me ask you, please rise, raise your right hand, take the oath. you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, pending before this committee? Yep. Let the record reflect the witnesses have replied in the affirmative. They are now under oath. We will now hear an opening statement from our witnesses. Uh, we ask you to keep it to five minutes. You may submit a longer statement for our record or to supplement our record at a later time. Uh, Mr. Lynn, if you don't mind, we'll start with you, if that's all right. I'm going to ask you to pull that mic over and speak into the mic. We'll be ready to go. You may uh, begin, sir. Thank you. I want to first thank the, uh, the ladies for their testimony. Um, we're here to talk about, in my case, you know, the, the impact on businesses, environment, but nothing can equal the impact that, that they have. So our condolences. Uh, my name is Kelby Lynn. I'm Vice President of the Chamber of Commerce. I'm also a owner of a real estate and property management company on Dolphin Island, Alabama. We're a small island that depends totally, totally on tourism, charter fishing, that type of thing. It's sand beaches. Um, the environment is probably our biggest draw. Once the um, news hit the press, we got ourselves into a situation where about seven days later, all of our cancellations, our reservations started occurring. Uh, we have 110 vacation rental properties that we manage for other owners on the island. We're one of the larger employers on the island. And as our business goes, so goes so many of the others, such as your t-shirt shops, your your restaurants, the small things. Uh, there's not a traffic light on the island, for example. Uh, there's five or six independent restaurants. We don't have a franchise. So it's all pretty much family geared and our tourism is pretty much family based. Uh, we have come into this season with the best year that we've 
experienced since I think a lot of you folks were here from uh, Hurricane Ivan and Hurricane Katrina. So I won't go into the hurricane history that everybody around here knows all too well. Um, but we, we were coming in literally year to date this year, we were 33% over last year. Most of us were coming in with the first year in the black that we had seen since 2005. Uh, that being stated, within the four weeks or five weeks, we lost over 175 reservations and dropped from almost an 80% future occupancy rate down to approximately a 30% future occupancy rate. The businesses that, that we have around us, um, it has all been in preparation. The government has responded pretty strongly. Uh, Governor Riley, in the last two or three weeks, has really stepped up and has started helping us a lot. BP's part of this whole thing is the preparation on Dauphin Island has actually been pretty strong. We have a lot of preventative measures that have been put in place. Uh, we had protective sand barriers that were built. We had the National Guard come in and put containment systems along the water's edge on the north side of the island. We've had several berms, or actually booms, that have been put in all the way around. Uh, there's been more preparation and actual need of work in the beginning. Now, last week, week and a half, is when we first had our first tar balls hit. And now we're into tar patties, and now we're into um, the connections of those, which is making bigger and bigger spill. We have not seen the devastation in the marshes that they're seeing here. Uh, we are primarily more of a sand beach. We do have our estuaries. We do have our, our oystering and things that are around us. But it has not impacted quite yet here, uh, or there like it is here. Um, it's coming. We all know it. We now know it's Pensacola Beach. We know the sheen is within a mile of offshore. Um, there has been significant odor at times, depending on the wind. The quality of life has not only for those that live there on the island, such as myself, but for anyone who would want to come visit, has definitely deteriorated substantially. There's no end to this, um, and I guess the next step I have to come to is, what is BP doing for us um, to help us get through this? The claims process has been cumbersome. Um, there, have been, there have been tremendous amount of $5,000 checks that have been just given out to the individuals, the fishermen, the oystermen, all deserving. When it comes to the small business side, to anyone who has more of a, a, a P&L impact or, or a business approach to things, we have seen nothing in terms of any claim response so far. In our case, we ended up finally deciding to go with a local attorney to help us through that because I'm still trying to keep the business together and must focus on it. I hated to do that, but. I feel that the claims process is not helping us in any way whatsoever, and it's going to take that type of clout. The um, suggestions that I have, I, I, I would hope, would come out somewhat more in the question and answers rather than go into, into here in terms of helping us. We do feel a little bit like the ant fighting the elephant at this point in time as individual businesses on Dolphin Island. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Duplass, you may want to pull that up there a little bit, please. Yes, first I want to also uh, express my condolences to the two very, very strong young ladies that spoke earlier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the Committee on Energy and Commerce for allowing me to tell how this tragic oil spill has affected me and my family. The worst part of this tragedy for me has been the unknown. A brief note about myself. My name is Clarence Duplessis. I was born in a small fishing community named Dave Ant, just north of Point La Hache, Louisiana in 1945. My family settled in Plaquemines Parish six generations before me. After high school, I joined the United States Marine Corps and served a tour of duty in Vietnam. While in the military, I met my beautiful wife, Bonnie, who was in the Navy. After the military, I worked here in Chalmette for Kaiser Aluminum. I was laid off in 1989 after the plant was shut down. After that, I went to full-time commercial fishing. 
In 2005, my wife and I lost everything we owned to Hurricane Katrina. Then just a few weeks ago, we were faced with the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. This one was the worst of all these stressful and economic tragedies. Now before the critics lower their heads and say, no way, I'll explain. During my tour in Vietnam, I was faced with an enemy that wanted to kill me. This was a problem with a solution. Kill them first, survive for 13 months, and the problem was solved. When Kaiser Aluminum shut down, I had a young family to feed, clothe, and educate. This also was a problem with a solution. I had experience with fishing, oysters, and also shrimping. I had salt water in my veins from birth. I went fishing. My children paid their college tuition by working as deckhands on the boats. And I might mention they loved every minute of it. In 2005, Hurricane Katrina hit us with a crippling blow, a major problem. Even then, though the entire region was wiped out, and the insurance companies packed their bags and left us, there was still a solution. And just in case there's anyone here who has not yet noticed, the people of South Louisiana and the fishing communities of South Louisiana are some, some of the hardest working, most defiant, yet kindest people on God's earth. After the storm, we faced the difficult task of rebuilding but that was the solution. Now, five years later, we're facing the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. This is the worst of our problems because there are no answers, no solutions, only questions. As we watch our livelihoods and even an entire culture being washed away by crude oil and chemicals that no one knows the long-term effects of, we ask, Will we have the mortgage payment next month? Will we be able to go to bed tonight instead of falling asleep in front of the TV hoping for some good news? What if they don't stop the leak? How long will this last? Will I be able to go archering next year or ever again? How long will it take the fisheries to recover? Will BP come around with the much needed monies they promised? Will BP do the right thing? or will they also pack their bags and leave us like the insurance companies did? What can I do to survive? What if we get a tropical storm or hurricane in the Gulf? How can I get a loan when the SBA still holds the mortgage on all my property from Katrina? I have a thousand questions and no answers. I hope now you can understand why this is the worst tragedy of my lifetime. I thank you for your time, and may God bless you all. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Solange, your testimony, please, sir. I thank the committee to invite me to testify, and again, my condolences to the young ladies, uh, Ms. Rostow and Ms. Kemp. It is certainly a tremendous tragedy. Uh, my name is Moby Solange. I received my PhD in marine biology in 1980 from the University of Southern Mississippi. And little did I know that the subject of my research, which was the effect of South Louisiana crude oil on benthic and pelagic fishes, would come in handy. My research focused on the pathological changes in vital organs of these fishes exposed to both whole crude oil and its water-soluble fractions, and the potential recovery once these toxicants were removed. For the past 30 years, I have worked with marine mammals specifically dolphins and sea turtles in the region. The waters of Mississippi, Chandelier, Britain Sounds, and the adjacent waters of the northern Gulf of Mexico are home to one of the largest dolphin populations in the United States. The sounds are also inhabited by several other endangered, threatened, and protected wildlife species. Dolphins are an important part of the ecosystem, and being on top of the food chain, are a good biological indicator of the health of the environment they inhabit. 
They are constantly impacted by a variety of both natural and anthropogenic factors. In the aftermath of the Horizon oil spill, it is now even more necessary and important to study the potential changes that may occur in both the dolphins and their habitat as a result of the oil spill. The Institute for Marine Mammal Studies was established in 1984 as a non-profit 501 organization dedicated to education, conservation, research on marine mammals and their environment in the wild and in captivity. It serves as a liaison between public and private entities interested in marine mammal science. The subjects of research that we have covered are very broad and include disciplines of population dynamics, underwater acoustics, health, genetics, microbiology, endocrinology, behavior, and ecology. The Institute has conducted studies in cooperation with scientists from the University of Southern Mississippi, Mississippi State, Jackson State, Oklahoma State, Portland State, University of Miami, University of California in Berkeley, National Marine Fisheries Service, <coughs> Naval Ocean Systems, Louisiana State, and the Naval Research Laboratory. The Institute is the only organization in the Gulf Coast states of Mississippi and Alabama with the capability and expertise to care for sick and injured marine mammals while simultaneously conducting programs in education, conservation, and research on marine mammals. The Institute has been a participant in the National Stranding Network for over 25 years, and a National Marine Fisheries designee has in, been involved in the care and rehabilitation of sick and injured marine mammals in Mississippi, Louisiana, and the Alabama. In fact, the Institute has developed a full-service marine mammal research and rehabilitation center in Gulfport, Mississippi. It is really fortunate that at least we have a facility that can at least help in the rescue, recovery, and rehabilitation of some of our endangered and threatened species. So far, uh, we have handled the largest number of sea turtles, which are over 100. Uh, only a few of them have been involved in oil, uh, oil spill-related activities. The majority, we have had no evidence of any oil damage. We have handled uh, uh, close to uh, eight or nine dolphins in our area, and so far none of them have been involved uh, in any oil spill activity. Uh, the Horizon oil spill is one of the largest in U.S. history. Uh, the Mississippi Sound and adjacent waters are very unique habitat, consisting of bays, bayous, estuaries, marshes, and barrier islands. The northern gulf is shallow, has a mud and clay bottom, and the tidal exchange is low as compared to other areas. The region is also very rich in fishery resources and produces a substantial amount of seafood. If the oil well is not capped quickly, the effects of the oil spill on the habitat and its wildlife could be catastrophic, and the time for recovery would be dependent on the amount of oil spilled in the environment and the time of exposure. Crude oil is a very complex chemical compound, and its degradation is extremely complex as well. Many crude oil components can enter the food chain and affect the productivity of the ecosystem. The potential effect of oil spill, including the large amount of dispersants used, will not only affect the ecosystem, but could also affect the livelihoods of commercial and recreational fishermen and tourism. This, in turn, could be a domino effect, have a domino effect on the regional and national economies. Oil exploration, like many other activities, has its benefits and risks. We believe that prudent development and use of our resources require adequate safeguards, uh, as well as safety net to protect the environment and those that make a living from it. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Subra, your testimony. Am I saying that right? How do you say your last name? Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity of presenting to this subcommittee. My name is Wilma Subra, and I'm providing testimony on behalf of Super Company, Louisiana Environmental Action Network, and the Lower Mississippi River Keeper. There are two human populations that are experiencing the most exposure due to the BP crude oil spill. One, community members along the coastal areas of Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and the upper Florida coast and two, fishermen and workers employed to install booms and clean up the crude oil spill. BP's ongoing crude oil spill has resulted in the formation of crude oil aerosols in the air. 
The aerosols have moved on shore way ahead of the crude oil slick and continue to move on shore along with the crude oil slick. These crude oil slick aerosols have caused and are continuing to cause community members to experience odors along the coast of Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and the upper Florida coast. In Louisiana and the other states, the crude oil aerosol has resulted in health impacts including headaches, nausea, respiratory impacts, irritation to eyes, nose, throat, and lungs, and asthma attacks. These health impacts have been experienced by people living along the Louisiana coastal areas in St. Bernard where we are here today, Plaquemines, Jefferson, Lafourche, and Terrebonne parishes, as well as the metropolitan area of New Orleans. New Orleans is at mile marker 100. That means it's 100 miles up from the mouth of the Mississippi, and it is people in New Orleans are also having these severe health impacts. These symptoms have also been experienced by workers and fishermen in the general area of the crude oil slick and the marshes and estuaries where the oil has come ashore. The EPA website clearly says some of these chemicals may cause short-lived effects like headaches, eye, nose and throat irritation and nausea. In order to offset the loss of livelihood, BP has, was encouraged to hire the local fishermen who have first-hand knowledge of the wetlands, marshes, and water bodies. These fishermen were hired to install the booms and to start cleaning up the spilled oil and the absorbent pads. On May the 4th, 2010, Louisiana Environmental Action Network and Lower Mississippi Riverkeeper received and began distributing protective gear to the fishers to utilize during their cleanup activities. These protective gear consisted of face respirators with organic cartridge goggles, gloves, and sleeve protectors. Lean and LMRK continued to distribute these equipment to the fishing community and to individuals who had gone into the polluted area. Workers hired by BP began reporting health symptoms such as severe headaches, nausea, difficulty breathing, and dizziness. However, the workers were very reluctant to speak out because they were scared they would lose the job and this was the only source of income they had. The wives, however, were speaking out because they were very concerned about their husbands. And then all of a sudden, the wives got really quiet because they were scared their husbands were going to lose their jobs if they testified. LDEQ and L Department of Health and Hospitals has stated that oil cleanup workers should avoid skin contact and oral cavity or nasal passage exposure to the oil spill products by using appropriate clothing, respirator protection, gloves, and boots. On May 7th, we went to U.S. District Court on behalf of the fishermen because they were challenging BP who didn't want to provide them proper training and proper equipment, and a consent decree was signed by BP that they would be responsible for appropriate training as well as proper protective equipment. Yet BP continued to fail to provide adequate protective gear to the fishermen. Super Company Lean and LMRK have provided information to the EPA on the lack of compliance by BP with the terms of the consent decree as well as OSHA not being there to protect the workers as they dealt with the oil. On May 16th, OSHA finally issued a detailed directive of the kinds of training that were required for each different kind of task, as well as having required BP to provide the appropriate gear. Still, BP failed to provide respirators to the workers exposed to the crude oil, and the workers experienced health impacts over and over and over again. However, when the, some of the fishers brought their respirators on the boats with them, BP told them, put the respirator away or leave the job, you're fired. Shrimpers that have been employed to do the booms are actually pulling in the booms with the oil on it from their shrimp boats with bare hands and no protective gear. As stated earlier, on May 26 and 28, there were workers that were injured and brought to the hospital and they complained of headache, nausea, dizziness, and chest pains. Then OSHA finally began to inform BP of their deficiencies as far as their worker safety programs. Let me just say that even after OSHA did this, the issue now becomes heat stress. One of the issues OSHA was pointing out to BP was they didn't have adequate protection of the workers from heat stress. So now the word on the street is you cannot use a respirator because it increases your risk of heat stress. However, if we are in a situation where the workers are being exposed to heat as well as the toxic organic chemicals from the spill, they should be protected against both insults, not using heat stress 
to allow them to continue to inhale the toxic chemicals. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you all for your testimony. Uh, we will begin with uh, questions, if we may. Uh, I'll begin. Uh, Dr. Solange, it, in your testimony, I'm um, looking at the second page, you indicate that uh, if the oil well is not capped quickly, the effects of the oil spill on the habitat and its wildlife could be catastrophic, and the time for recovery would be dependent on the amount of oil spilled in the environment and time of exposure. But my question is, you know, not only do we have to cap the well, stop the flow of oil, but then you have to have some cleanup, and then it's still going to be around for a time before the waterways can purge itself of this oil, correct? That's correct. Uh, one of, uh, part of my research was, uh, in the 80s, was, of course, you expose uh, animals to oil for different concentrations. Uh, the question was, how soon can they recover? And so it was really dependent upon the time of exposure for how long did you expose uh, both pelagic and benthic organisms and how long it took for them to recover. And we did find, uh, uh, amazingly, that uh, nature has a way to recover, but the speed of recovery depends upon how much they're exposed to and how long they were exposed to. And that's what I was referring to. Well, I showed this ad earlier by, by British Petroleum. I bring it out because yesterday we're down south of Venice there where the mouth of the Gulf goes. And in the marshes there, we saw the oil. There's really no way you can get in here and clean that up, is there? It is very difficult, and it's going to take a natural process. One of the biggest problems with this particular uh, disaster is that uh, it's very difficult to mitigate these issues. You know, we are all very familiar with uh, hurricanes and earthquakes. We can build roads. But it's, you know, it's going to take time uh, for nature to fix itself. In the area we were yesterday, uh, Pass La Troll, am I saying that right? Pass La Tre? Pass La uh, They said 90% of that area is affected. And the only way you can really flush this out, clean this out, is really through the Louisiana and Mississippi River flushing itself naturally, right? That's, that's one part of it. Of course, there'll be natural uh, degradation, there'll be bacteria, there'll be other uh, processes that will take care um, uh, of eliminating the oil, but it'll take time depending upon how much oil there is. Small amounts for small periods of time, nature has its way of uh, taking care of it. We do have natural seepages of oil in different places, and nature takes, uh, but this has been the most concentrated amount of oil that is coming through. And if it continues to come through, you're going to see a prolonged exposure and a prolonged effect. So the initial effects of, of the oil on mammals or, or any of our uh, aquatic life really depends on the time of exposure, and I'm sure each species must depend on what amount initially affects it. Will just just depends on each species, right? Yes, uh, Congressman, that's an excellent question. Uh, uh, the the lady to my left had mentioned about inhalation and problems Correct. 100 miles away. Many of these animals breathe right on the surface or close to where the oil spill is, so you do get respiratory problems. Marine mammals specifically are just like you and I. They breathe air, they give birth, they give milk to their young ones, and, so you, and they eat the fish that is contaminated. So it's really compounded uh, considerably when these animals that are very close uh, to the surface or to the spill. And so uh, I think it's going to be a very significant issue in mitig mitigating uh, the after effects. Mr. Duplices, uh, did you indicate, did, did you receive a uh, $5,000 check from BP initially for your loss of uh, revenue? Yes, I did. Nothing since then? No, uh, I met just yesterday with an adjuster, and uh, he said that I would be getting another $5,000 check. Well, I, I was reading that uh, the, the shrimpers and f f can go out and maybe earn Five to six thousand a day if, if they have a good day, right? That's 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 right. Uh, okay. When, so when, so like Mr. So like Mr. Cooper, AC Cooper was going to testify today, but he was asked to go out and do some uh, cleanup. Right. So he, he's the what head of the Louis, Louisiana Shrimp Association. So this was his opportunity. So unfortunately, he couldn't be here today. He took the opportunity to work. I also read like it's almost like a. a a lottery-like, or I don't want to say a lottery, but you might work for a few days, 
on the cleanup, but then it's a month later before you're called again. So do you get the 5,000 check for working for a few days or just as sort of like an initial payment? I guess I'm trying to figure this out. The, uh, the, the, the $5,000 uh, payments that they've, they've been giving out to the commercial fishermen um, is supposed to be to, uh, uh, in mitigation for lost wages, for lost income. Uh, now, but that's only a day's first, work, right? For shrimpers. And, 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 yes. Well, don't. Uh, I mean, we <laughs> shrimpers may we might make five thousand dollars to do one day, but then we have these long uh, down periods that we don't, you know, sure. we don't have income at all. But uh, for example, the first time I met with the adjuster. Uh, my wife and I sat there, and, and, and he asked the question, well, how much are you losing this month? And how much do you expect us to, uh, uh, to pay you? Right. Well, my wife went through the papers, and she says, well, last May we made uh, $27,000. And, and he says, well, we're going to give you a check for $5,000 now. And you give us your, your uh, proof of income, and... Next month, we'll, we'll uh, finalize these adjustments. Well, I just met again with them yesterday, and uh, another $5,000 check is what we, we're going to get, what they promised to me anyway. So you're still 17000 short from one month? From one month, yeah. Well, let me ask this. BP puts out these uh, daily statements, what they're doing. And they said more than 2,600 vessels are now involved in the response effort, including skimmers, tugs, barges, and recovery vehicles. So that'd be some of the shrimpers and other people working in the Gulf going out there. There's not 2,600 vehicles out there today. There's been, that's like the cumulative amount over the last seven weeks, 49 days since this bill's been going on, right? Well, my name's been on a list from day one. Okay. And I have yet to get a call from BP to go to work. So your boat's never been my out there? My boat's never been out So you might be out on, you might be one of these 2,600 vessels that they speak of, but your boat's never seen the water. That's a possibility. <laughs> I don't know. Burgess for questions. Thank you, Mr. Duplick. Let's, uh, let's, let's stay with you for just, just a moment. Now, the $5,000, and again, I just, as a, a student of the consumable crustacean, I thank you for what you do and your contribution to the country's economy, and, and it is important that we get you up and running. The $5,000 payment that you get, is that like a, a How's that being treated as business interruption insurance? Or are you taxed on that? Uh, is that to go just to, to, uh, to pay your overhead that you're not able to pay, but not anything for, for your income? What, what, is that, what does that $5,000 represent? BP's explanation is this is payment in lieu of final settlement. Okay, so it's a it's a temporizing measure on their part. That's that's their explanation to me. And I would never tell the IRS, but how are you and your accountant handling that? Is that taxable income to you? Oh, I would imagine it is. Yes, I, I would say it is. It's not treated as business interruption insurance, which obviously would be an insurance payment that would come to your business that would then not be taxed, at least that's my understanding, and I'm not an accountant, so don't take that to the bank. Yeah, I'd have to uh, talk to my accountant about that. <laughs> Mr. Lynn, uh, you're from Alabama. Mr. Stupak's not the only one with the newspaper. Uh, Wall Street Journal this morning, uh, reading it on the plane down here on the way from, from Texas, um, talking about the, how emotions are boiling over in Alabama. A BP official met with local leaders on Saturday to discuss cleanup efforts, and he was threatened with incarceration. I've got a solution. We can put you in our jail, and you can sit there until you figure it out, Edward Carroll, a city councilman in Orange Beach, Florida, told Bob Fryer, a BP senior vice president. Is that uh, pretty reflective of the, uh, of the feeling back home? It is uh, rapidly escalating in terms of frustration. Uh, we, the, uh, the gentleman here was talking about the boating situation at 2,600 vessels. We were told uh, we had we invited BP to speak at a, a chamber meeting to for our, our local businesses. They told us basically that there they had 1,400 vessels. They had 400 uh, contracted. They had 400 in waiting and 50 on the water. 
which kind of blew us away. Yeah, that's um, yeah. Now, we were not in, we, we were beginning the war with the tar balls and the things. You know, we weren't totally slammed at that point. But that was sort of the attitude. Uh, the money situation is the same, same thing. The 5,000 has been giving out just almost as if it's more a marketing ploy than it really is an accounting ploy. Um, they are coming back with second payments to some of the folks, but the Vessels of Opportunity folks that have signed on, that actually have been called and are working, have not seen monies as of this morning at 9 o'clock when I called. Um, the businesses, when you talk about $5,000, we have a $60,000 a, uh, a month overhead for my business. So I would get two and a half days out of that. Um, that's why I ended up saying, okay, I've got to do something else. I've got to go. I am now doing an SBA loan, which I had no intentions of having to try to borrow again, but this is on and above another one that we have from the hurricanes, of course. Uh, it's the only way we're going to keep our business alive is to have cash flow. We do not feel that BP is going to be stepping up to the plate. Yeah, but an SBA loan um, with no end in sight to this, I mean, how, how, how are you going to manage that aspect of the cash flow? Our problem right now is survival over the next six months. I feel that between you guys, everybody stepping into the plate up here and helping us out, I feel that um, there will have to be some help from BP coming down the road. We had approximately two months left of cash flow. Yeah, I'm going to interrupt you. I agree with you there. There will have to be some help. Uh, Dr. Super, let me just ask you a question. You, you detailed in the, uh, <clears throat> the safety concerns that you have. Where is the EPA in this? I mean, this is federal oil. These are federal hydrocarbons produced on federal land. You talked about OSHA. You talked about Louisiana Health and Human Services. But should not the EPA be out there front and center uh, issuing, to, to heck with what BP says, the EPA should be giving the directive for these people to have protective gear. We just finished a very contentious 9-11 bill in our committee where the EPA under a different administration was excoriated for not having done more to protect the people who were sent to do the cleanup of the 9-11 site and now Congress is, is left taking care of, of taking care of their disabilities for the rest of their natural lives. Why is the EPA not more proactive in this, in this environment, in this, in this emergency? We've been, we've been working with EPA from the very beginning on this, and they have put up monitors on the shore, on, on the solid land. There are three in Chalmette from Araby South, and then there are three in the Venice area, and they also have mobile monitors. So EPA is telling us that BP is responsible for doing the monitoring out in the areas over the slick and in the boats and in the area that the workers are working in. That data is supposedly have been given to EPA, but EPA has not made that public and we have asked for it now for a week and a half to receive the BP data so we can see exactly what they're monitoring and if they're monitoring for the right thing and what kind of conditions because we know the fishers are sick. Well, it seems like the EPA should assert its authority and cause BP to put the protective gear, make the protective gear available to the the people who are involved in the cleanup. After all, it was BP's fault that they're out there having to clean this stuff up in the first place. Just my observation, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Braley, for questions, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to focus on the BP claims process because BP has repeatedly stated to this committee and to the public and the press, we will pay all legitimate claims. And when I missed the tour of the marshes last night because of a flight delay in Dallas, I got in a car and I drove down to Venice in a monsoon. And I was, I was driving back last night, I saw a sign on the side of the road that I think captures the attitude of most people in the golf course toward BP right now, and it said, damn BP, God bless America. And I think that's how these witnesses who have gone through so much in the past 40 days feel about what's happening to them their way of life, their families, and that's why this hearing is so important. Because when I was down in Venice, I saw a lot of vessels that were sitting in dock, and when I talked to the folks down there, they told me they hadn't been out in days or weeks, even though they were hired by BP. So one of the things I want to talk to Mr. Duplessis and Mr. Lynn about is this BP claims process. <coughs> well, we have heard that 
They created a claims process for fishermen and for small business owners impacted by the spill. And Mr. DePlessis, you talked a little bit about how that claims process worked, but as I understand it, you are required to present documentation, and if you're a boat captain or a deckhand, you can receive from $5,000 uh, up to $5,000 per check up front. Is, can you tell us a little bit about how that process actually works? Uh, from the start, well, when they started the, the, the program, they, they sent out a list of uh, things that we would need for proof of income for them to, to uh, mitigate this. Uh, they wanted three years of income tax records. They wanted trip tickets, which are tickets that we uh, use on the boats for shrimping and oystering, uh, log books for the oyster people. And I went in with everything they requested. The, uh, the guy almost looked like he didn't want it. He just, he took the three years of income tax records because I, uh, my wife had already uh, uh, made, three, made copies for them to take. I, I almost had, to, I forced them to take it. Here, you want it? I, I've got it. And uh, they issued me, the, the following day, gave me uh, a check for $5,000 and said that this was not payment in, in, in full. And I might add, when the payment process, when they first started the program, I, I was a, a week or two uh, into the process before I, I, I did mine. Uh, the attorneys, local attorneys and the state's attorneys read the paperwork that they had the fishermen sign and they were actually signing paperwork that was releasing BP from liability when they signed this paperwork. So, so they, they were requiring you to sign a yes. waiver against exactly. future claims in exactly. order to get this upfront payment. Exactly. And I'll bet you nobody explained that to you when you applied for that first payment. Well, by the time I got there, the state's attorney had was all over BP and made them do away with this paperwork. But it was after some of the oh, recipients yes. had oh. already received payments oh, yes. and signed that well, paper agreeing to waive claims. Yes, but they also made them uh, take those paper and, the papers and uh, null and void them. <laughs> so. Now, you indicated in your opening statement you had a thousand questions and no answers. Is there anything about your experience with the BP claims process you'd like the American people to know, Mr. DePlessis? It's a cluster. It's, it's, it's a total mess. Uh, just a, 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 three days ago, there were three adjusters in this building taking claims. Three fishermen would walk out, and each one were told different things from each individual adjuster. One fisherman, it's a good friend of mine, told me that the adjuster uh, basically threatened him by telling him that, uh, hey, you have a, a, a big, a very large uh, uh, top line here on your taxes, and your, your bottom line is very small. Uh, uh, we want to put you on notice that you're going to get payment on this bottom line, not your gross income. Mr. DePlessis, my father enlisted in the Marine Corps when he was 17 and served on Iwo Jima, and I just recently interviewed my cousin who served in the Marine Corps in Vietnam during the Tet Offensive. You are the embodiment of the Marine Corps motto of Semper Fidelis always faithful, and I am very grateful you came here and shared your story with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Were those adjusters BP representatives or insurance companies for BP? I think they are uh, hired, contracted okay. adjusters. Mr. Markey, for questions, please. Thank you. Uh, Tony Haywood, the CEO of BP, said that 
um, BP would pay for all legitimate claims uh, of um, fishermen, of uh, tourists, tourism-based uh, industries. Um, you presented your bills, your profits from last May, and it was $27,000. But they only gave you a check for $5,000. Uh, what did they say to you? They said that this was not a final settlement, that there, there would be, this was only the beginning of the process. And, and, and in other words, what they're saying is that they're, they're just giving this amount of money to us to hold us over until final mitigation. Okay, so BP, but, uh, BP made $6 billion in January, February, and March of 2010. They say they're going to pay every legitimate claim. You walk in with your tax records proving that last May you made $27,000. Yeah. So what did BP say to you? They'll, they'll wait later? Or are they just waiting you out? Are they just waiting for the kind of the storm to pass and they won't have to pay all these claims for all of the fishermen? Because that's what I suspect their real plan is. I'm just hoping that it doesn't end up the way I'm thinking it will. When the storm's over, they're going to pack their bags. You know there's a law right now that does protect them against having to pay I know that. any more than $75 million to all of the fishermen of the Gulf, to all of the tourism industry of the Gulf. They're only really responsible for cleaning up the mess out in the ocean. But in terms of the impact on you, there's a limit of $75 million. Would you support repealing that law so that there is unlimited liability for BP to ensure that all of you are paid? Not because BP, out of the goodness of their heart, determines that they're going to give you a check, but because the law requires that they have unlimited liability. Would you like to see that law repealed? 100%. How about you, Mr. Lynn? No doubt about it. Repeal that law. How about you, Mr. Solange? I agree with you. How about you, Ms. Subra? I agree. All right. So we got agreement on that. Um, how, about the, how about the Jones Act? Do you want to repeal that law, the, you know, the limitation on damages uh, for families? Uh, Mr. Lynn? No doubt about that one at all. Mr. Of Please? course, yes. Yes. I agree with you. I agree. Agree. Now, uh, it, I think what we're seeing already is uh, business as usual at BP. Uh, giving you $5,000 when you have incontrovertible evidence that last May your family made $27,000 uh, is just the, the, the beginning of a long story that we're going to have. Uh, and uh, as Mr. Burgess just said, we just had a big debate nine years later about the health impacts on people who are working on 9-11, people exposed on 9-11, and there's still a debate as to whether or not we should basically take care of those people. We're having a hard time doing that now. And the lesson we learned, Ms. Subra, is that we have to get in at the beginning. We have to give them the protection at the beginning. Do you think that BP is providing the resources necessary in order to ensure that the equipment is there, the training is there, uh, to protect these people who are being exposed to these chemicals? Not adequately, and that's what we've been working on since the very beginning. Mr. Solange, do you think BP is doing the work to ensure that there is a full understanding of the impact these chemicals are having on the ocean, on all of the unintended consequences of shooting dispersants into the ocean in terms of the impact that it can have upon the livelihoods of people who live down here in the Gulf? I don't think they were prepared for it, and I think uh, not enough has been done yet. Yeah, BP did not stand for be prepared. We know that for sure. Uh, but we don't want to see them nickel and diamond each one of these issues either. 
uh, in order to ensure that there is full protection. In terms of uh, tourism, Mr. Lynn, what has BP done to ensure that there is some anticipatory help for you in Alabama? They granted, uh, that's okay. They granted uh, $25 million to the state of Alabama. Which How much did you say? $25 million $25 million. To the state of Alabama. Part of this is for preparation. Part of it was for adverse advertising, you know, to try to counter all the, the things that are being said in the press. How much does the how much does the tourism business it, make in Alabama? Um, I'm not sure of the grand total. I know Orange Beach and Gulf Shores are the big brothers. We're the smaller brother, and I think we bring in somewhere in the range of around, as a state, it could be in the range of 70 million, but I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, seven. Okay. 70 million, I think, 70 million. as a state Mr. of Mark, Alabama. Mark, you will be going I'm another round. Sure. Thank you, gentlemen. Does that work? Go ahead. Go ahead. Finish your question. Answer. Uh, the the trickle down effect on that is 10 million is going to uh, Baldwin County, 10 million is going to Mobile County, which is on our side. Uh, Baldwin has the Orange Beach Gulf Shores guys. That's being broken down to um, approximately 7 million of it on our end was going for preparatory use to prepare a second protective sand barrier to try to stop the oil on the beach. They're not doing it on in the water uh, because of. Uh, surf and things like that. Uh, it trickles down from there to um, a good sizable sum was going back to the fishing community to help there, again back to the vessels of opportunity. And I think we ended up with the Dolphin Island Chamber of Commerce in conjunction with a town of 125,000. My goal is going to make sure they have unlimited Mr. Get questions, please. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Lynn, I want to follow up on uh, something, on, on some of these questions that Mr. Markey was asking, because um, Mr. Duplessis also confirmed something you said in your written testimony, while it is grossly inadequate, that some of the, the fishermen and the um, shrimpers are getting some payments of $5,000 a month. But what you said in your written testimony is for the small businesses like you, uh, you have overhead of $60,000 a month. The, the claims process seems to be much more cumbersome. Have you been um, getting any payment from BP? None whatsoever. You've um, got no payment whatsoever no, from BP. We started out talking directly to BP uh, I was transferred from one department to another department because they had not dealt with a small business, uh, according to the, the gesture that I had, or the you know, guy on the other line with BP. Um, it is now my understanding that while we have on Dolphin Island and in Bayou Battery, our neighboring city, two claims offices, they are not geared at doing anything more than gathering information from the small businesses. Everything is going to Hammond, Louisiana, and it's processing four states' worth of small business have activity. You, have you been given any indication when you might start getting some compensation? No, ma'am. In my case, I did go to an attorney, local attorney, to start helping me with the process because I was getting and, and nowhere. And are you having to pay that attorney to help you get I'm afraid it will be coming out. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, that bill will um, be coming in the mail. And that is, again, why the SBA became important to me. It's not that I want another loan. It's that I have to keep so, active. So now you're having to take out loans. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Supak was talking about this. You're now having to take out loans to keep yourself afloat because the claims process is exactly. so slow. Exactly. Um, and do you think this claims process could be made more easy? I guess, let me back up. Mr. Duplessis, I think, has the most organized wife, maybe as organized <laughs> as my husband is. You can even, you can, is she here? Thank you. So, so, so you can find out from May of last year what your income is. I assume you have similar records. I do. I have good records. Uh, in fact, it's the same information uh, that we are supplying to the SBA is pretty much the same information. Right. And, and, and so they should be able to determine what kind of compensation you're going to get is yep. it as, if, as Mr. Markey says, uh, Mr. Hayward, he, 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 by the way, when he said this, he was under oath, just like you are today, mm -hmm. that everything would be made clear. So do you expect that's going to happen? My, my real hope, and this is the only statement on this part I'll make, we as individual small businesses, the fishermen ourselves have have not we, we do not have a chance of fighting BP. We will not win that battle. You guys 
can help us. The SBA can help us. I should not be borrowing money from right. the SBA. I should be getting a grant from SBA that BP pays, and you guys get the money from BP. Well, guess what? We intend to we intend to help you. So we can't do it on our own. As you heard, we we are going to stay on this until we do. I just have really a couple of that. quick questions, Ms. Supra, about the environmental impacts. Um, because you talked in your written and your oral testimony about these disperses and your great concern for the Gulf Coast residents. The EPA has also expressed concerns about the burning of oil and the use of oil dispersants, and they've asked BP to use less of the toxic dispersants. Do you know what BP's response was? Well, EPA used, asked them to use less toxic yeah. ones, and they came back basically justifying the existing one, and then EPA used them, asked them to use less. One of the major concerns I have is that most of the constituents of the two dispersants they're using are proprietary. So when the workers were ill... You mean the chemicals that are inside the Right, the, the chemicals that are in the dispersant are proprietary. Mm -hmm. So when the workers are ill and they go to the hospital, the hospital staff doesn't know what potential well, chemicals they were exposed to, so they don't know how to treat them. And it's an issue that we've been working on for a long time, that that kind of information needs to be available to the general public, but if not to the general public, it needs to be available to the medical to people the first responders immediately, and... so that they know how to handle the cases. Now, now, uh, is there some alternative to these dispersants to start to begin to clean this up? Wait, could you ask is that Is there again? some alternative way to, to clean this up? to minimize the risk than using the dispersants? Well, well, the alternative ways are to have it as a slick and recover it from the slick and disperse it into the water column, which has a, a huge environmental impact when it's dispersed into the water column. And both the slick and the dispersed chemi chemical in the water column come on shore. It's just when it's dispersed in the water column, it's not as visible as when you see it coming on shore as y'all saw when y'all went, went on the tour. Thank you. Thank you. Let members know we're going to try to go two rounds here if we have time here. Uh, we're trying to wrap up by two, but let's get one round through, and if we can, we can get a second round for this panel. I found them very interesting. Ms. Schakowsky, uh, questions, please. Thank you. Um, Ms. Subra, you've told us that BP forced uh, commercial fishermen who signed up to work on the cleanup to sign waivers that severely eliminate, uh, limited any future legal claims, but that was resolved, was that in court that uh, these waivers were removed from employment agreements or did you just get them to do it? How did that happen? We went to court on May 2nd, Sunday afternoon, as a result of the inappropriate waivers they were making the Fishers sign, and BP signed an agreement that those waivers would no longer apply and that was limited to the state of Louisiana. So even when he talked about them not knowing, once, once we get a decision in court, it's not enforced. Five days later, we went to court, and the court said BP must train and provide the protective gear, and again, it's not being enforced. So we've done all the right things. It's lack of enforcement and lack of engagement so on a lot of the So first of all, agencies. though, the agreement only applied to Louisiana. In the context of this, did BP ever explain their rationale for saying that they uh, wanted to remove any liability for themselves? No, they no. just agreed in court that afternoon and signed an agreement that it wouldn't be appropriate and therefore it wouldn't hold water on any of the agreements that had been signed previous or it wouldn't in be included Louisiana. in the new agreements. In Louisiana. In the, well, the, uh, it, they did the agreement, and then the states of Mississippi and Alabama stated if it was to apply in those states, the case would have to be brought in those cases. I see. They um, made that decision. Now, are you saying that BP still is not providing any kind of uh, appropriate protective gear? They're providing Tyvek suits in some cases. In the case of those shrimpers, they weren't provided that. They are not providing the respiratory protection, and that's where you get the inhalation of the toxic chemicals off the spill and any dispersants. And in fact, if the workers bring a respirator that we've provided them, and others have provided them, they tell them they're gonna fire them unless they put the respirator away. 
And now since OSHA has said you need to protect them against heat stress, they're using heat stress as an excuse not to have them wear the respirators. And in fact, you can't deal with heat stress and just ignore the inhalation threats. You need to address both issues. And yes, it's very hot in Louisiana. It's very humid. But this is a workplace environment and they need to be protected against both situations. So your organizations have provided at its expense, this, these private organizations, mm -hmm. with equipment that now they are prohibited from using. That is what BP is doing. They're prohibiting the workers from using the respirators. And tell me the role that OSHA has played or the role that you think OSHA should play. I think they should be out there enforcing the regulations that they have to have appropriate workplace safety and protection for the workers. And have you, but to the extent that, uh, well that's their job, but have you seen them and is this work being performed? Well, they were a little slow in coming on the scene, and we had to work through EPA to demonstrate that, that they were really needed. And then they issued a directive on exactly what kind of training and the protective gear, and it was required by BP to provide that. And now we're seeing when they're going out and evaluating, they're really taking on BP and focusing a lot on the heat stress. And still the workers are getting sick when they inhale the off-gassing from the slick and from the uh, aerosols. And I assume you've brought that to OSHA's attention as well as to the, the company. What's the response to that in terms of the respirators? The, the issue of the heat stress versus not wearing the respirators just came to light after I had prepared my testimony over the last four days. Okay. So we're trying to figure out what kind of response we can get through EPA and to OSHA th to BP, so we're working on that right now. Some of these economically stressed workers who were hired to do this job apparently expressed fear that they would be fired if they complained. Right. Is, is that uh, accurate? Yes, and I'm, I'm hearing that from fishers all the way across Louisiana as well as in Mississippi and Alabama. And, and were any fired because, or, or how did they get that impression that if they complained that they would be fired? from working for BP or BP's contractors. And have people been fired that uh, have complained? The Fishers will tell me and tell a lot of the uh, NGOs this, but when it comes down to telling it to someone that'll do an affidavit, they're very reluctant because they're desperate for these jobs. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Ms. Christensen for questions, please. And then I'd like to um, thank the witnesses for taking the time to be here with us this morning. Um, and thank you for two rounds. Um, Ms. Subra, in your testimony you say, and this kind of follows on to what um, my colleague Ms. Schakowsky was asking, you said decisions have been made that have and will continue to result in detrimental impacts to human health and the environment as a trade-off for attempts to reduce the quantity of crude oil from reaching the shores, estuaries, and wetlands of the northern Gulf of Mexico. Both are important. Why can't we do both? Why can't we protect the health and the environment, as well as protect the shorelines, the estuaries, and the wetlands? Um, is it not possible to do both? What is it that you think needs to be in place? to make sure that we can do both, because both are important. We need to protect the wetlands and the estuaries, and we need to protect the health and the environment. This is an advanced country. This is the leader of the free world. Can't we do both? First of all, the response that BP has provided as the oil moved closer to shore and came on shore in the wetlands and on the sandy beach areas and dispersed it into the water column and came on shore in the water column has not been adequate. It has allowed the slick and the dispersed to come on shore and contaminate the wetlands and all. But the issue of the workers, the workers should have been protected from the very beginning. It's a bad enough situation we have with the oil coming ashore and contaminating things, but there's no reason why these workers shouldn't be hired and shouldn't be put in a position to be totally protected as they do their jobs for BP. If BP had a job site on a rig, you would expect them to have total 
protection and safety for the workers, and yet these people seem to be treated as if they're expendable, and if they try and protect themselves, they are threatened with being fired and losing their job. So it's, it, it comes down to the protection issues, the, the protective gear, the masks, and so forth. That's what it comes up. That, that's what we need to focus in on. Right, when they're, they're dealing in the area with, with the crude oil, they need protection to, to stop the inhalation pathway of exposure. Yeah, and you know, um, in all of the hearings, as I said in my opening statement, I've asked about protection, protective gear, and have been assured that that was in place. So um, those assurances obviously d didn't mean anything because it wasn't until your organization and other organizations and residents forced the issue that it began to take, be in, put in place. So thank you, thank you for the work that you've been doing. Um, Mr. Lynn and Mr. Duplessis, uh, obviously with this being the largest oil spill in the history of our country, um, there's lots of media attention. On balance, from your perspective, has it been, has the overall impact and balance been positive for your businesses or negative? Uh, what, what has been the impact on tourism and fisheries? Is the full story being told by our media or is it just the bad side and what is the impact of the media been? The impact on, by us on the media has been pretty much 90% negative. Uh, it's hard to have a positive impact when the only thing that they can bring to the, to the table is the ultimate contamination of the island, the, the pictures, of the, the, the awful pictures of the birds, the environmental quality. Um, we have been fielding so many calls regarding people trying to cancel in our case, and this is up, I'm, I'm really am speaking for pretty much most of the Alabama tourism coast with this. Sure. The, the questions they're asking are, do we, do, do we have to go out and look at these dead birds laying on your beach? This is the impact that, this, that, that the press has had. Uh, our PR guy for the town of Dolphin Island did a quick study, and you know these numbers are approximate, but they, they looked at the average advertising costs, if we'd have gone out and bought the, bought the time, it's $7.5 million in negative advertising. Now, we have a $40,000 a year advertising budget for the Chamber of Commerce, so we've mm -hmm. got a battle of the uphill, but that's, our, our impact is, has been terrible, as a matter of fact. Mr. Dupas? Just like Mr. Lennon said, uh, uh, Everything that comes on the TV is birds that are being, that are oiled and uh, uh, all negative, negative, negative. Now, uh, our area, our Seafood and Promotion Board did manage to get some money from BP and they are uh, uh, running some, some pretty good advertisement about our seafood that is still safe, which is it, it, it's hard to convince people that the seafood is safe when you've got uh, 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 oyster areas that are being opened and closed uh, uh, daily, and uh, uh, shrimping areas are being closed and, and not reopened. It's 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 hard to to convince people that the seafood is safe, and it's it's negative. And, and as far as the media is concerned, and and, and the TV and everything, I'm up to my neck in advertisements saying, if you have been aff affected by the deep water horizon oil spill, I'm up to my neck in it. I, I, I'm just <laughs> You've had enough. Uh, and to you, Mr. Duplessis, the okay. Louisiana promotion. Time. My time's up? Yes. Okay. I, I'm gonna call it a little tight, just so I wanna no, get a second no, no round problem. in. No Mr. Problem. Malone's on, questions it. please. Five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Uber, let me ask you, and of course, there's been a lot of issues about the dispersants and whether it's uh, it's helping or hurting long term. Uh, but I guess where I'm going with it is, with or without dispersants, what do you see if we shut down the oil tomorrow, which would be wonderful? But what do you see in a time frame for recovery for the Gulf and for the estuaries? Should they be impacted? 
I see a very long term recovery. I think that estimate is better served after we've stopped the flow of oil and we've gotten rid of the slick as well as the dispersed water column right. oil. And then we will have information about the contamination both in the marshes, the wetlands, as well as the sea bottom. And then we'll be able to figure out an estimate of how long recovery that's, will that's take. That's why I was using, if we shut it down tomorrow, which I pray that it would happen, or at least they would get it closed off, because it's somewhere in a range of a half a million barrels to a million barrels a day is, I think, where the numbers are. That's five, that's five, that's 12 to 19,000 or, 19, or 20,000 barrels, um, barrels a day. So that's, I'm sorry, million gallons a day. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. DePlessis, in light of the fact that this may be a decade long degradation problem to the estuaries, to the place where the shrimp start their, their life cycles, where the speckled trout, the redfish, the snapper, and all that that comes out of the estuaries, what's in your mind? What's in your thoughts? What, what are you feeling right now is the future for you and the communities like Gulf Shores, Grand Isle, Venice, Point La Hash? Uh, Mr. Malonson, just like you, I am a sport fisherman and hunter. Uh, and I, I, I've been trying not to discuss it, but I have four children and uh, 14 grandchildren. All four of my children hunt. We're big time duck hunters. And as my grandsons grow up, we're, we're teaching them and we're taking them out in the marsh hunting. And this part of our culture is, is it's, it's really, it's devastating to just think about it. I, I can't, I won't, it's a possibility that I won't be able to take my grandkids out and hunt with them. And uh, the other side, the economic side of it, uh, I'm 65 years old now. I'm not young anymore. I can't, I can't uh, 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 change my livelihood. So uh, it's, it's, it's going to be, it's going to well, be, a rough 10 years ahead of it, it, It's exactly the feeling I, I have. Uh, Mr. Lynn, you're on the opposite side in, in one respect, but I remember Dolphin Island when it was like a Grand Isle. Uh, of course, it's probably more condominiums and more of a beach now. But what, what do you feel? I mean, we can clean the beaches quicker, but you've got those estuaries right behind the island uh, that are important to the fisheries. That's what brings people to Dolphin Island. How are you feeling about this short-term, long-term? I, I think that's the, the, the biggest difficulty that we're all having with this. None of us can get our arms around it like you can a hurricane, which you know, no one wants to hug one. But we can see an end, we can fix things, and we can get on with our life. Um, Dolphin Island really hasn't changed that much at yeah. this point. Now. We have a couple of condos, but the, the culture, the, the, the whole life, I, I fear, is, is going to be decades. And that's, that's even an if, because the stigma of what is going on here, how long will it be? We're still being told that our island was cut in half by Katrina, when actually it was a part of the uninhabited part. That's five years later. This kind of a stigma of our oil on our beaches, the estuaries, the shrimping, the oystermen, the culture, it's, it's, it's gone. And none of us from day to day know how we're going to cope through this. We're talking short term, keep your business alive. A year from now, are we going to be able to survive in the same business? Or is it just pack it up and get off the island? And none of us know. Yeah, when, when this first started and the SBA came and said, we'll do, if I can just finish the thought real quick, started talking about the emergency loans, which they could defer payments for a year, yes. which give you the opportunity. I thought, well, oh, great, you know, because that'll give the business owners and the fishermen and those people that are impacted an opportunity to see where this thing is going to play out. But if we're talking about a decade or decades, it's not going to play out in our lifetime. And it may not play out in my son's lifetime. 
And I, I will say one thing on the SBA, one phone call and my two, deferred, my two loans were deferred for 12 months. It was not a hassle, it was we're here to help. So I have to give them that credit. Mr. Scalise, for questions, please. Can you use that mic? Try this. All right, we'll keep it hot. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Subra, when you were talking about the, the testing that EPA is doing, uh, it's over land, and you said BP is doing the testing over the water right now for air quality? Is that? that? That is how it is now. EPA is doing on the land, and BP is supposed to be doing it over the water and in the uh, work area where the but workers. we're not getting access to, to those air quality reports over water? We've asked for it over the last week and a half when we found out that EPA was receiving the data from BP and not putting it up on their website, then we asked for it at that time. Why, why is an EPA putting that data on their website? Have you gotten an answer on that? I haven't got an answer. Well, then we will get that answer for you because there's no reason if... if it would be very the EPA hel helpful is, to have is that monitoring data. the air quality, and that's that's what their job is. They're tasked with doing that. Now, why they would see uh, parts of that to BP, I don't know. But uh, if if they've got access to the data, either they should be doing it or they should be getting the data and making it public. But uh, it shouldn't be withheld from the public for sure. Uh, so we'll, uh, I know my office will work on that, and and if if we can get the committee to to dig deeper there too, to get some to get some real transparency from EPA on that air quality. Um, I want to talk about the chain of command, and, and maybe Mr. Duplessis, Mr. Lynn, y'all can touch on this. Um, one of the problems we've been having is getting, uh, getting things done when, when our locals who, who are doing everything they, they know how to to try to protect the marsh, to try to protect our way of life, uh, it seems like we just keep running into roadblocks and uh, locals are told to go talk to BP and you can't get answers there sometimes. Uh, what have y'all found uh, from uh, the, the defensive efforts? I know we fought for weeks to try to get this, uh, the sand barrier plan. It took us over three weeks to get an answer uh, from the federal government on putting sand barriers in front of the marsh to try to at least protect the marsh. But what are y'all seeing when it comes to uh, protecting beaches, protecting marsh? Uh, are you directed to go talk to BP to get approval? Who, who's, who's telling you to go where? Mr. Land first and Mr. Duplessis. Uh, basically, um what would have normally been a Corps of Engineer type project on our island in terms of beach renourishment and things like that was, was all put aside. Uh, between BP and, and the federal government, I believe, I know the National Guard was highly involved, they came in and within three weeks time, um, we had a protective sand barrier along our, our main road, which is where the water and sewer infrastructure runs in order to try to protect. Because of the hurricanes, our island has lost a lot of sand on the far west end, where all the tourism really is. Um, any high tide with a, with a southerly wind can actually cause an overwash on that west end, which brings stuff right into the sewer system. So that was the reason for that protective berm. Um, the, and y'all got the, that approved from BP? Or who, who, it, it was actually a BP start. It was um, Clean Harbors, um, Dr. Um, Oh, he, he's helping us actually with yeah. the town of Dolphin Island and doing a I'm study. I'm glad y'all did because, it, <laughs> like yeah. I said, it took us over three weeks and we still yeah. went round and round. I don't even think they yeah. started we, directing we, any we sand. We had action yet. quickly on Dolphin in Island. Front of our march. Uh, we, we truly did in terms of actual emergency protection devices. Okay. Mr. Duplessis. Well, I'm from uh, Plaquemines Parish, as you know, and uh, Billy Nungesser, bless his heart, they're gonna, BP is going to cause his demise. Uh, <laughs> I've been in talks uh, with, with, with Billy, and I tell him to take care of his health, because yeah, <laughs> he, he's, he's working hard, I know. Right. Um, with the, uh, the, the, the berm or the, the, the rebuilding of the chandelier in Britain Islands, uh, we, we've been trying to get this done for years, as you know. And, uh, trying to get, I, I, I really don't know what the problem was with, with, we had the Corps engineers, we needed approval from the Corps engineers, and uh, they took, what, three weeks, four weeks, and uh, finally they got approval of part of it, and then... Uh, yeah, still have only approved one-fourth of the... One fourth of the of plan, it. and and again, right. I don't it's, think they've even started dredging sand, and we're uh, six weeks into this disaster now. 
I don't know if the problem is, is, is not knowing the effects, the long-term effects, like, as they say from studies and stuff, but uh, uh, as, as far as my side of it, they've been studying this for years. Been studying it for years. So why should we have to start new studies? Man, I think we what know, was most irritating we, to us is We know that said, it'll help. Yeah, when they said we need environmental studies, and in the right. meantime our environments right. are being destroyed, right. but and I know I'm out of time, but uh, so, we've got to set up a better chain of command because I know the president keeps saying he's in charge, and then every time something's not happening, nobody wants to be accountable for it. When you can't get boom, when you can't get burn, when you can't get there's still things like this happening every day, and even though the president says he's in charge, we're not getting the resources we need, and, and nobody wants to say they're in charge when things go wrong. Well, that's when you need leadership. So I, we need to protect well, your oyster beds. We need to protect those seafood beds. We need to protect Dolphin Island. I understand and I don't think, that. Yeah, I and don't think enough's being done. Thank yeah. you. you. And you at the that. same time, uh, I can also understand our president's position. Uh, if, if just like with the, with the drilling, if everyone says, well, you know, he, don't stop the drilling, don't stop the drilling. But if, if he says, go ahead and drill, and next week we get mm -hmm. another oil spill, the same people that are saying, go, uh, you know, go ahead and drill, they're going to say, hey, you dummy, you shouldn't have done that. We just had an accident. Right. We just want to so, make sure you know, they follow the safety a, guidelines that are already right. there. And we, clearly they weren't. All right, Mr. Please, I'm in charge, so I have to take control of the hearing. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to ask members to respect the time, the five-minute time, so we can get through another round of questions. Everyone's expressed interest to do another round, so let's get another round in if we can, because we promised we'd finish up here by 2 o'clock. Let me ask this uh, sort of quick throwaway question, but do any of you believe the uh, estimate of oil coming from that blown well, as BP says? You're all shaking your heads now? Okay. Um, Dr. Solange, let, let me ask you this. In, in your statement, your last line, you said, we believe that prudent development and use of our resources requires adequate safeguards as well as a safety net to protect the environment and those making a living from it. What are the safety net you're looking at? We were down, as I said, way down south yesterday, uh, the marshes outside of Venice, and you could see oil rigs only six or seven miles from the places where of concern endangered species of birds, insects, animals live. Uh, we were all alarmed to see how close the rigs are to places where people and animals live, and we're surprised how many rigs were cleared visible from the coastal land. Uh, Dr. Cowan told the committee staff that platforms, and I don't know if they, you have it for the witnesses, but we have this document here. There's like 3,500 oil and gas platforms in the Gulf, uh, very, very close to the shoreline along a 200 miles of coast here. Um, I, for one, believe in oil, uh, drilling for gas and oil, but I just think there's some environmentally sensitive areas you, you really shouldn't do it. It took me a long time, but I got the ban on oil and gas drilling in and under the Great Lakes, uh, that, which my district comprises three of the five Great Lakes. I don't think we should be drilling for oil and gas there. So, and, and I was surprised. It looked like there was, right in the marsh, there was a well being drilled as we were on the um, fan boats there yesterday. So what are these safeguards we should have here? I think this is an engineering issue, as you have said, that. Uh, for decades, you know, uh, it's a fact of life. Oil and gas is uh, crucial to this country and its survival, and it can be done properly. Uh, there are many, many safeguards, engineering issues that be, can be done. Uh, this is an anomaly. We have had uh, uh, really a lot of questions why it happens. And it is something that uh, both nature, I mean, a lot of people go to the rigs to do fishing. Rigs can become a part of the ecology of the system where you can see increased productivity. So it's not all negative, but if it's done properly, if it is done safely with all the proper safeguards, and I think it is your job to make sure that accidents like this don't occur. Small uh, issues can be reconciled. I mean, that's human. It, it seems like the engineering to drill deeper and drill in more sensitive areas has been developed. But the technology, the engineering, if you will, the, the science behind a cleanup is the same science that we did back in the 19, early 1900s. Burn it off, try to mop it up. I, there doesn't seem to be, at least from where I sit, and I'm no expert in this area, there doesn't seem to be the emphasis on what if something goes wrong, how do we contain it, how do we shut it down? It, it seems like we've developed one side of the equation, but not the other. You're absolutely right. I think that is the side of the equation 
people are having difficulty with as to what do we do now? How do we respond to emergencies like that? And we are lacking in that aspect considerably. Okay. Uh, Ms. Subra, what's the long-term effects of inhalation of oil? You also mentioned pulling in these booms by their hands, uh, oil on the hands. What, what's the long-term effect? Well, first of all, there are two major components of the crude oil. There's volatile organics, which uh, it's contended that they off-gas really quickly, but in a lot of cases, it's not off-gassing real quickly. But one of the components is benzene, known human cancer-causing agent. The other major component of the crude is polynuclear aromatic hydrocarbons. And a large number of those components are known and suspected to cause cancer. So when they start inhaling it, they take it into their body, and they're out there working, and they will be out there working for an extended period of time. And if they're not protected, they're having the acute impacts, which is what I described, and then they can have the long-term impacts. They can have cancer, but they can also have heart and lung problems that increase with the increased efficiencies of breathing it in each time into the body, going home at night, coming back out, getting exposed again. So it's the chronic, the heart, the lung, and the uh, potential of cancer that are for the long term. And what we don't want is we don't want to create a population that became contaminated because they weren't provided with proper protection. You mentioned enforcement. You get a court decree and then people are not enforced. Who's the responsible for enforcement? OSHA, state and federal OSHA? OSHA primarily because it is a, okay. a, a workplace issue. The agencies at the federal level have the oversight and the ones that are at the command center could do something to require that VP actually provide the protective gear, which the court has said, which the agencies okay. have said, and which OSHA has said. Okay. So it's a big enforcement issue as well. Okay. Supplement your, in, your uh, testimony with the request for those air monitor information you want and also the dispersants, and uh, I'm sure our committee can get some answers. Uh, Mr. Burgess for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Dr. Super, let me just stay with you for a second. You said the uh, the EPA is, is monitoring on land and BP is monitoring on the water, is that correct, the air quality? That, that is how it's divvied up at this point, yes. And is the, is the land monitoring data being made available real time on the, uh, on the EPA's website? Could you ask that again, please? Well, do you have access to the, to the levels that are, that are being recorded on land? That EPA is monitoring for, they put them on their website, usually with one to two days delay, but it, they are up there on a regular basis. Now, you said the, uh, the concern about the off-gassing and the crude, air, crude oil aerosolization, uh, the EPA had the official statement, uh, wrote down that there were only short-lived effects, is that correct? Correct. And yet, if the levels of these hydrocarbons and benzene are higher, there could be long-term effects. Is that correct? Right. The, the concentrations in the aerosol are being detected in the monitors that they have on land. And the monos, monitors okay. on land are some distance from the marsh. The, worker, the workers are exposed to a lot higher concentrations. But my understanding from watching some of, the, some of the news shows that there are people who are not involved in any of the work at all, but just simply who simply live in the area who have complained of some of the respiratory complaints, some of the dizziness and nausea. Is that happening? Could you ask that again, please? People who are not involved in the cleanup, people right. who just live in the area, right. are they being affected? Right. They're having an effect from the aerosol that's, that's in the air that's being carried on shore when there's a south or southeast wind. So and whose responsibility is the protection of those individuals? Obviously, OSHA would not be the, the federal agency. The federal would. health agencies. Okay. And are they, are they fulfilling their, their obligation under the, under the law? They're, they're starting to send uh, some of the uh, and, mobile a, clinics. That's a yes or no question, not they're starting to. Uh, are they fulfilling their obligation? Not adequately. What are, what are some of the levels of benzene that are being recorded on land uh, by OSHA's monitors? Well, I'm sorry, I couldn't quite understand. Well, uh, the OSHA monitors that are now up and, and deployed, what, what are the levels of benzene that, they are, that they're recording? The amounts of benzene that they're picking up on the land, on the in, land. in the six monitoring locations do not exceed 
the ambient standard in Louisiana, but they're very close to the ambient standard. And the ambient standards are established to determine where in the general area it exceeds that standard and what are the sources and work on reducing the sources. So is that the 1.4 parts per billion standard? Yes. And it, to date, with, the air, with people complaining of the odor from the, from the spill, those, those levels are not being exceeded? The benzene level, but the cumulative impacts of all the chemicals, all the volatiles that are being detected, the cumulative impacts are sufficient to cause the health impacts. And we have asked over and over again for analysis of the semi-volatiles, and they have not started that yet. The EPA has not. EPA, correct. On the, uh, you know, what did surprise you to learn that the, the uh, application that was submitted by BP to Minerals and Management Service uh, suggested that they did not have to provide uh, environmental data in the if, in a worst case scenario. Um, I know Mr. Dingle and myself brought that up this up at our very very first hearing, and the the application that BP submitted was woefully inadequate. So shame on them for not not filling that application out, but shame on Minerals Management Service for not taking that application back to them and saying, this is not acceptable. You will have to show us how you're going to mitigate the environmental effects. If you're drilling a well that's capable of producing 100,000 barrels of oil per day, if this thing gets away from us, you're, from you, you're going to have to show us how you're going to mit mitigate those effects. But that, unfortunately, was lacking in the application that was approved by MMS. Mr. Lynn, let me just ask you a question, because I am so concerned about your, and I appreciate that the SBA has been good to work with, but having run a business myself, I, I understand when you start borrowing for operational expenses, uh, you can only do that for so long. Um, is, are you the, the sole signatory on those SBA loans? It's my wife and I. Where's it's a corporation. B, where, is there a line there where BP can sign on? That's what I'm sure hoping you can find, but they have not offered it yet. What if they go away as a consequence of this and you're going to be left holding those loans? Is that correct? Uh, totally. Yeah. Uh, you know, that just seems like an unsatisfactory arrangement and one that we should, it, we should try to remedy. It's like being on the second floor of a building on fire, though. You have a choice of burning up or jumping and taking a 50% chance you'll live on the fall. That's why we're getting loans. We, we know BP's not going to hold up at this point in time within a timely fashion. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Burgess. Mr. Braley, for questions, please. Dr. Solange and Ms. Super, I want to follow up on the point that <clears throat> Dr. Burgess was just raising because it seems like this um, process was upside down and backwards from the beginning in terms of the leasing approval process and the environmental analysis because we know that the, the way the courts have traditionally looked at this type of environmental impact analysis, they are supposed to have a more exacting review of that environmental impact as drilling becomes imminent, and yet the exact opposite happened here. Because we know that the multi-sale economic impact statement done in the preliminary stages of the review did examine the possibility of a larger offshore spill for these particular leases, and even though it never in analyzed the impact of those spills, it reached the conclusion that a spill larger than 10,000 barrels had greater than a 99% chance of happening during the 40-year lease, lease period under consideration. And yet, despite that information in the permitting process, a conclusion was reached by MMS that an offshore spill larger than 1,000 barrels would not have a significant environmental impact. What do you think of that conclusion, Dr. Solange? Yep. I think it wasn't adequate. Uh, those were all hypothetical considerations, and uh, really, uh, you know, it wasn't a well thought out process. Ms. Subra? I think it's almost impossible to have a spill the size that they said and not have any environmental impact. And yet, this obviously got accepted and the process moved forward. One of the other things we know is that BP had discussed a worst case scenario response in its initial exploration plan for this lease, which is referred to as Mississippi Canyon Block 252, indicating that it considered a potential large scale spill. And their exploration plan 
said that the worst case scenario would be a blowout at the exploratory stage leading to a spill of 162,000 gallons or 3,800 barrels per day of crude oil. And their exploration plan indicated that their regional oil spill response plan for a worst case scenario had been approved by MMS. And yet we know that during the hearing we had previously, the CEO of BP testified that they were capable of handling a release of 250,000 barrels per day without having a disastrous impact on the environment. And yet their initial representations is this spill we've been talking about was releasing somewhere between 1,000 and 5,000 barrels per day. So what do you think of BP's representations to MMS during the permitting process in terms of their capability of handling a catastrophe of this magnitude? I think at this time they have not demonstrated that they had the capability of handling a catastrophic uh, uh, oil spill, which was a couple of hundred thousand barrels. I mean, right now I believe it's more than 5,000 barrels. And uh, ultimately, you know, we're going to find out that uh, this wasn't very well thought out. Ms. Supra? It gets back to enforcement or oversight. And if they put this forward as they were able to handle it, they should have had to have a mechanism to demonstrate they could. And obviously, they didn't have the capability because this spill hasn't been contained and has caused environmental damage. So how much, as you review these applications, do you just accept as face value? And how much do you require them to provide sufficient information of how exactly they would handle such a situation? Well, one of the things that's hard for me to understand, given the magnitude of this spill and the region it's affecting is how a company like BP can get an exemption at the later stages of the leasing process that, that prevents them from having to do an environmental impact study considering all of these different scenarios based upon where that well is located. Because if you look at the regulations and the notice that MMS issued on May 1st of 2008, if you are in Florida, and Florida could be an affected state, you have to do the more detailed analysis. And Dr. Burgess, I'm also shocked to see that if you are in Texas, and Texas is a potential affected state, then during the initial exploration plan, you have to go into more detailed analysis of the impact of such a spill. And yet we know that in the central Gulf region, where this well is located, they are not subject to those same requirements under MMS's own regulation. So I think we need to have MMS look closely at that issue because I don't care where you are in the Gulf, I don't care how big the economic impact from the oil and gas industry, we have to protect the livelihoods of the people like the witnesses we have today. And I'll yield back. Thank you, Mr. Burley. Mr. Markey, for questions, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Subra, uh, you mentioned that BP wasn't uh, publishing BP's air quality data. My staff asked EPA why not. EPA told us that it can only post its own quality control data. But on May 20th, uh, EPA and the Department of Homeland Security ordered BP to publish that data on its own. Uh, and they have complied. And it is on BP's website. Uh, if uh, you want access to it. Have you had an opportunity to look at that? No, I haven't, and I will. Yes, so Thank I'm you. told that that is the case, that it is. But it would um, also be great if EPA also I put it on there you. so I, all the data is in one I, place. I think that the more information we can put out there, the better. But the good news is that it's on BP's website. After today's hearing, uh, we'll make sure that uh, it is uh, viral, that uh, everyone has access to it. Thank but you. it is uh, out there. Um, Dr. Solange, what do you think uh, could be the longer term consequences to the health of uh, marine life as a result of exposure to these dispersants? I think it could be uh, devastating. Um, uh, the, the area that uh, we're looking at is very unique. Uh, it's not unlike uh, Valdez or the Prince William Sound. These are bays, bayous, estuaries, a muddy bottom, a very uh, the flushing, you know, the tidal fluctuation is very minimal, one to two feet per day versus 10 to 12 uh, 
uh, in other areas. Uh, I'm sure you, you hear, hear about mud masks, you know, when you go to a beauty parlor or somebody, mm -hmm. mud actually retains oil. And uh, most of your bottom from here on to the mouth of the river has mud and clay and it's going to retain uh, quite a bit of these toxicants. It has what, is, what is your concern, Dr. Solange, that this combination of oil and chemicals that is creating a toxic stew out in the Gulf of Mexico could have on the food chain that human beings are exposed to? Are you concerned about the health impacts on human beings? Absolutely, sir. I think this will go through the food chain, smaller organisms eating larger organisms, and uh, it, it, through bioaccumulation, through biomagnification, you will see some of these contaminants uh, go through the system. However, nature has its way of trying to get rid of them, and uh, as I've pointed out in my uh, testimony, that the amount of exposure will and the time of exposure will determine how nature will fix itself. Uh, eventually, it'll take time to fix it. Uh, we've had, uh, uh, during the uh, uh, war in uh, Iraq, 500 million gallons were spilled in the Arabian Gulf, and it has taken time to recover. So, uh, but again, there are serious consequences from the area, especially the, uh, the wetlands and the, uh, the bays and the bayous that are, are the area with a critical habitat for young fish and shrimp and others to, uh, uh, to develop. So, so we could have health impacts that come from human beings eating uh, that, seafood in the future that have unfortunately been exposed to this toxic stew of, of uh, chemicals and oil. That's uh, We correct. have human beings right now who are being exposed uh, to chemicals. Uh, and oil that could have long-term negative impacts on the health of Americans. Uh, I just think that there should be no expense spared to ensure that uh, we put in uh, the preventative uh, health care uh, guarantees that we are not going to allow uh, for uh, this to affect uh, the people down here in the Gulf especially, but ultimately all across the country, because this food chain starts here. Uh, but it goes right up the Mississippi and right up uh, the Atlantic coast as well. Many of the fish that spawn here wind up being caught by fishermen uh, up uh, in George's Bank, off in New England. Dr. Uh, Solange. Yes, sir. You could take, take over my job. You, you very eloquently <laughs> summarized uh, in my testimony. Well, I'm, again, I'm only reflecting your testimony. Yes, what sir. You, what you it's say in your it's, testimony. It's and very it, appropriate. It, it, and you eloquently summarized uh, what I was wanting to say. It is, it is, uh, this is powerful, what we're hearing here today. And, uh, and, and one of the things we do uh, uh, is by monitoring the dolphins being on top of the food chain, like we are on the top of the food chain in the terrestrial environment, uh, the smaller fish eat larger fish, and eventually the dolphins become the good, the canary in the mine. And by monitoring them, we can monitor the environment. What ultimately happens to the dolphins will happen to us. You have, all of you have laid out a blistering, scalding indictment of what uh, BP has left as a legacy for the Gulf, for the generation to come. Uh, we, uh, we very much empathize with all of your problems, and we are going to try to do our best to make sure that uh, BP and the federal government are there for you as long as uh, we have to. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. Mr. Gett, for questions, please. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Salenji, I want to follow up on, on, on the uh, questions about the dolphins because um, you said that so far you have seen eight to nine dolphins that have, or treated that have not had oil damage. I, ex I, I assume you expect to see, see some oil damage as it works its way up that food chain. Absolutely. Uh, the, in, uh, this time of the year, uh, all these, uh, this is the birthing grounds for the dolphins. We have approximately three to 5,000 dolphins that inhabit the area from Britain, Chandelier, and Mississippi Sound. Uh, they come to shallow waters to give birth, so we, ha we have a double jeopardy. We have a whole bunch of baby dolphins and baby turtles all out there, and these are very inquisitive animals. They go into these lakes. The first thing they do is they inhale. They have respiratory problems. Then 
they have skin problems and then they eat the contaminated how, fish. How long would you expect to see uh, before you start seeing those effects? In, I would in say in the next couple of weeks, we will start, start seeing uh, many of these mammals start coming to shore. We, we heard last night from the Fish and Wildlife Service and from the state that there were about 100 dolphins that they had um, seen. Only one confirmed with died from oil damage, but they're also expecting to see more. So we should expect to see these these impacts occur. And and do you have any projection about how how large the impact will be on these dolphins? I think it could be a very serious consequence. As I mentioned, we have about three to five thousand estimated in this area, and with a large number of uh, young babies having been born, uh, it could be very serious. Um, Ms. Subra, I had, a, I had a question based largely on the fact that I'm from Colorado where heat stress is not a big worker issue. And my question is, uh, you talked about how people are being, uh, workers are taking, being told to take off their respirators and not use them because of, of the heat stress. Is there some kind of a a, a way that people can't, that we can treat both of those issues at once, that they can both use the respirator so that they don't suffer the, so they don't inhale these contaminants and at the same time that they can, they can be relieved from this heat stress? Okay, first of all, they're not giving them the respirators in the first place, but they're using the heat stress as, as a reason not to give it but to them. But is there a way we yes. can both have right. them use the respirators and mm -hmm. also treat that heat stress? Sure. And how would that work? Well, what, one of the ways you avoid the heat stress is you provide sufficient shade and enough cool liquids to keep you hydrated. Okay. And then if you are hydrated and you are not being impacted by the, the heat, then you can use the respirator and work right. and not have it stress your body that well, much more. Well, that's what it seemed like to me. It didn't seem to me like the breathing was really related to the coolants and the shade part. And it is difficult to breathe through a respirator, but you have to remember that the majority of the people, even though we've heard testimony differently, are fishers from this local area. That's what we had gotten an agreement on. Right. And those fishers are used to working on the water heat. for long time yeah. periods of time in the heat and in the sun. So if they provide them with what they need and don't depend on the fishers to bring out sufficient right. cool drinks and a mechanism of shade, they can work with the respirators and not stress their body right. and protect their body. I, I'd like to hear Mr. Duplessis' opinion on this because he's been fishing in these waters. I think BP's uh, uh, thing with the respirators is more of a uh, public relations thing. If uh, the cameras see these people with res respirators, they're going to say, hey, this is dangerous. Uh, even though they know it's dangerous, uh, I think it's a uh, PR thing more, more than anything else. That plus the, the, the good respirators are expensive. That could be part of the problem also. So, 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 but, but, but what, what Ms. Supra is saying is there, that if people are inhaling these chemicals, that could be a very bad health damage. And what she's saying is if you gave people the respirators, don't make them buy them themselves, but BP pays for them, they put them on and they have sufficient uh, um, shade and they have sufficient hydration, they can both have the respirator to protect their health, but also not get the heat. Um, stress. Would you agree with that? Exactly. The people down here are, are used to the heat and, and the humidity. And, and, uh, I think it would be less stressful on the body uh, with the heat rather than the fumes. Yeah, right. And less harmful, uh, no yeah. doubt less harmful. Okay. Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Thank all of you for coming and sharing your wisdom with us. It's really, there, there's no substitute for going out in the field and hearing exactly what's happening. And we really, really appreciate it. We've learned a lot today. Thanks, Mr. Kitt. Ms. Schakowsky, questions, please. Yes, I, I want to uh, echo my colleague, colleague's statement of gratitude. Coming here really does equip us, I think, with uh, a different perspective when we go back on what really not only is happening, but what needs to be done. Um, so thank you very, very much. Um, I would um, used to spend a week every summer with my family at the at Navarre Beach, which is um, right next to the National Lakeshore near uh, near Pensacola, on that 
amazing white sand, sugar white sand uh, beach. And I saw a piece on television last night where um, they, one of the local officials had called on BP because there was some, um, there were these oil globs that they wanted BP to get to work on. And it took a long time to get any response and at the end, they, uh, hours later, they, in any case, the response was inadequate from, uh, from, from BP. It sounded to me like um, they were gonna get some local, um, either volunteers or government. So I have a couple of questions. One, what has been the experience in terms of the timing of the response for help from, the request for help from, from BP? And secondly, um, what has been the state and local response and is there decent coordination going on? One of the things that we felt when we came down from the, for the hearing on Katrina was that the bureaucratic snags of various levels of government um, really postponed the kind of responses that should have happened. So um, first, Mr. Lynn, if you would um, tell us your experience. For Dolphin Island itself, which uh, said we're the, we're the little brother of, of the Alabama coastline, uh, we actually had um, an advanced amount of preparation that was almost an overkill at the time. Uh, they were using us as a staging ground. It became um, pretty much um, the, the command center, shall we say, for clean harbors, O'Brien, Interstate, all of the major cleanup contractors that have been hired by BP. Um, also, in Mobile was a, was a strong strategic point. So we, we had a lot of people wandering around, hundreds of people wandering around on the beach in hazmat suits when there was absolutely nothing there, um, which also had its own issues. And you see that you may have seen the child in the swimming water, in the swimming suit, playing in the beach with the hazmat people behind them walking around. That made national news. That helped us a lot. But besides all that, uh, our initial preparation was we did have people on the ground when it came time. Um, they are working in the range of 20 to 30 minutes an hour, we were told, again, because of the heat stress issues that are going on out there. Uh, Orange Beach and Gulf Shores seem to be much less prepared, and I don't know if that was from government response, local effort. I really don't know about what happened there. Uh, it's my understanding, though, that they were going after quick training to try to pull in unemployed folks in the area to get them out there and to start helping. I think part of the problem was they did not think it would get to them. Um, Dauphin Island is always sort of on the west side of the bay. We sort of catch all the grief and all the stuff. Mobile Bay comes out and washes to the, to the west. I think everybody is surprised at the enormity of this thing and that it's now at Navarre that is now at Pensacola and Apalachicola is running the road. So again, one of the things you want people to know is that Dauphin Island has uh, come on down for the summer. Is that what you yes. want people to say, to, to hear that, we, you know. We would have the, liked to have seen that. Uh -huh. <laughs> but now, even that is a hard thing to explain, even on our own website, the first thing on our homepage is a zero to five impact. We had to do it, I mean, we're an upfront, company, you, you can tell people come down, but when we have odors in the air, we have tar balls on the beach, um, changing environment every day, National Guard on one end of the island, three command centers on the island. It, it's not, and sand, sand protection, sand barriers, which we're so glad they're there, but you gotta climb over to even see a beach, let alone get to it. We are not a vacation heaven right now. Got it. Um, other comments about the, uh role of local, state, and federal government, and how that coordination is going. Any other comments on that? Well, down in Plaquemines Parish, which is more or less the epicenter, uh, uh, it's, in the beginning, was mass chaos. Uh, we had people in news media and BP and everyone was uh, crowding down to Venice, Louisiana. That's where uh, uh, most of the boats were leaving out of Venice. That was the closest uh, uh, land point from 
from the the actual rig site, and uh, it was it was pretty bad at first, but uh, now it's it, it's kind of calming down. But it, it seems uh, in this area it's been a, a, a parish by parish operation. Each parish has been doing things a little differently from the next parish. It's not like during the hurricane uh, uh, evacuations when all everybody, it's, you know, it's been planned and we evacuate and, and things run smoothly with the counter flow and everything all the way up to Mississippi. Everybody is coordinated together. But this thing hit and nobody, there was no one with plans. This was a surprise, so we were ambushed. And, uh, but now it's, it's, it's the, the local governments uh, kind of getting it together. Thank you. Chair recognizes Dr. Christensen for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Dr. Solange, um, you said that the dolphins can be the canary in the mine, or in this case in the sea, I guess, when you're talking about the food chain, the impact of the uh, ingestion of oil or toxins in the food chain. What, is, what do we know about the impact on dolphins who have ingested uh, oil and toxins, at least, or other sea life that has ingested uh, oil and toxins? What has been the impact on the dolphins? Yeah, we have been studying dolphins for the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, we're being part of the stranding network. Any animal that dies, we get to uh, bring him and, and do necropsies and pathologies. And I have uh, in the room uh, Dr. Chavez, who is our veterinarian, uh, does an outstanding job with us since 1993. And we have been able to develop uh, some sort of a background profile. And by studying the environment and the animals, we have uh, really positioned to understand what is going to happen uh, to this particular, uh, in this environment, in response to this particular episode. So uh, uh, we not only see what the ingestion is going to do, but what the other environmental factors. We swim in it, the animals swim in it. We eat the food, they eat the food. So it, it is a good model, and that is one of the things that I think uh, we are capable of doing that will be using one particular model to give us a, a, a big, broad understanding of what may be happening. When you see a large number of animals showing up on the beaches, uh, we can be assured that uh, we would be next. Thank, thank, thank you, Dr. Stelangi. Um Mr. Lennon, Mr. Duplessis, I'm concerned about the workers. I, I'm assume that, assuming that you have employees. Um, have you had to lay off employees during this period? And, and if not you, the two of you, what about other um, people in your industries? And what is happening with those workers that might have been laid off? Are they being employed by BP or are they just still looking for work? Um, from a, of course, the individual, the oarsmen, the fisher, you know, fishermen, that group, uh, a lot of them are under contract or have at least been able to get some sort of income started up. The retail businesses, um, the real estate businesses, property management companies, most are taking, I know of some layoffs that have already taken place. Um, in our particular case, actually we added a person uh, to handle the overflow and the deterioration that was going on. Um, back to the small business loan, I hate to bring it up, but that's another reason, is our primary interest is to keep the employees that we have. It's been a family effort, not as family goes, but they've worked for us for years. I understand. Um, so we're their only hope on that island. There's not other jobs. You can't go and go to work for Walmart. Um, we have 20 to 25 contractors that work the base under us that fix houses, that do all these things. Without having companies such as ours, and this is across the, the board, um, I don't know where people are going to turn. They're an independent bunch. Um, that's why they're there. Um, so I, I really don't know what they're going to do. I hope, I hope that somehow, with your help in this whole situation, we'll be able to turn the tide and survive. And I think they all feel the same way. Thank you. Uh, our company is a small family company also. And uh, most of the, uh, the, uh, the workers that we employ are deckhands that work seasonal. And uh, when I don't work, they don't work. So uh, 
they're not employed either. Thank you. I think I'll yield back my time. Just let me again join my colleagues in thanking uh, all four of you and the previous uh, panel for, for coming out and testifying and sharing this information with us. Thanks. I see a gentleman from Louisiana. I would point out that when you gave me that lighted pendant for St. Bernard's Parish, I didn't know I'd be yielding five minutes to you sitting here. So I would yield to Mr. Melanson for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Braley. Um, let me try and, and, and put some things in perspective for the committee. Stafford Act applied to a natural disaster, disaster declaration by the president. Basically, when that disaster's declaration is, is put forth on a natural disaster, all agencies, everything the government has can be applied. Under NORA, the event of national impact, it is a totally different response because we have not the vessels, not the equipment, not the technology. Uh, the only thing we can basically put is the boots on the ground and try and help get the boom that's coming down and the other things to make the Coast Guard, of course, be more forceful uh, rather than just being go along, get along, go along, uh, which it appeared perception was uh, early on. Um, Wilma, it took me two weeks to get a mobile health clinic to Venice. There is, West Jeff has put a facility on Grand Isle, but BP would rather put people that get ill or whatever in, in an emergency unit and send them up to Lady of the Sea, which is about 30 or 40 miles away. Closest hospital to Venice is about 80 miles away, Oshner, across the interstate uh, from Bell Chase. Uh, so the frustrations of the expectation of what the government should or shouldn't or could or couldn't have done is kind of out there and it's blurred. And so there's frustrations all around. Uh, one last point. After Katrina, in an effort, because Stafford Act was not adequate and we're finding out that the national oil spill response is not adequate and we need to reform and amend and, and take care, because this isn't a spill, this is a leak. And Katrina Stafford Act didn't take care of all our problems, and we found reforms we had to do there because it, was, it lacked adequacy. So with those two things, regardless, I am finding in our first hearing that an agency of the federal government waived the law so that a permit could be issued to drill. And I couldn't get a federal agency to waive a rule after Katrina to help the people of this region. Waiving a law, I don't think, I think that's basically breaking the law. Uh, so we need to look as deep as, as possible to find out what's going on. With what little time I have left, let me offer to, and since uh, you're one of my constituents, Mr. Plessis, the four of you, if you've got anything that you have not been asked or you wish that you'd like to express, um, Please, Mr. Blesses, first, if you've got anything, or if anybody else has anything they'd like to just add. Just one little comment. The gentleman here was talking about the dolphins. My wife is heartbroken because one of our favorite things to do was on, when we were shrimping to hand feed the dolphins, when we would shut down at the end of the day and go on anchor. She would hand feed the dolphins. I couldn't get her to work for two hours. <laughs> That's all. And it's going to be sad if we lose these dolphins. That it will. Mr. Lynn? I, I think we've really, um, I think you've asked some very astute questions. And I, I, I hope that we've kind of given you a feeling for, one, our frustration, but really the dire straits we, we, we truly are in at this point in time. Wilma? I think the reason why people are here and the way of life, if that changes, uh, it could have a, a very significant impact, not only on this region, but for the entire country. There's a huge impact. It's just not a Mississippi, Louisiana, Alabama issue. And uh, I think, uh, you know, we should look at it prudently. There's, uh, we shouldn't go into uh, emotional decisions, but let's make some good decisions, rational decisions, 
so that uh, everything is balanced. I think that's what gets lost in uh, you know, panic situations where you lose rationality. And so there's a lot of uh, uh, things that we need to think about and fix and make sure that this never happens again. And in that same vein, I think we have to be very aware as we go through it because it's like each day there's a new, new issue, a new oops that comes to life and accumulate that information as well as what happens when the flow stops and how long it takes after that. Learn from those and, and put together some mechanism. I wanted to respond to her issue of them not responding quickly. When the slick hit St. Mary, Iberia and Vermilion, BP said that they could not respond and start doing any cleanup until they had samples taken and analyzed to be sure it was proven to be their crude oil. And if that's the same thing that's happening as the slick is moving in Mississippi and Alabama and Florida, that's something, it's clearly coming from the, the rig site and moving across the Gulf. There's no question whose it is and that you lose very valuable time in addressing the problem immediately versus waiting three, five, or seven days for the lab to get the results back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Malone Song. Um, during Katrina, Mr. Malone Song kept our committee's feet to the fire. I mentioned we came down here, but uh, we're going to have more hearings. You'll be able to ask those regulators who waived the rule. We'll have those hearings probably later this month. Uh, and if we're not doing a formal hearing, as Charlie insisted we did, uh, on Katrina, we would invite the parties up and they would put them in a room until we resolve some of these differences and cut through that red tape. So I just want you to know your delegation, especially Mr. Malone Song, because we saw him on Katrina, uh, is always there representing and fighting for your interests. Uh, with that, uh, Mr. Scalise, uh, questions please. Five minutes. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. And I know one of the many things that we're dealing with and fighting with is uh, trying to maintain the integrity of, of what Louisiana seafood means. And obviously for so long, uh, we had built that up. It's a, it's a prized commodity. It's a, uh, you know, our, our chefs are world famous in, in many ways because of the things that they've uh, done and taught the world how to do with, with Louisiana seafood. I, I don't think there's anything better than the taste of a fresh Louisiana oyster. And uh, with that, Mr. Duplessis, uh, there's a lot of people that have misunderstandings. I, you know, that there's tremendous testing done, and anybody who can buy Louisiana seafood today, they're getting good quality seafood. The problem is how limited is that commodity and, and, uh, and, and how much is available, how much will be available in the future. Can you tell me first uh, how many seafood beds are, are still open today because they're in areas where there's no oil versus how many that are closed because of the threat of the oil right now? Today I can't tell you. Yesterday uh, we had... Uh, I think out of 14 areas, there were like uh, six areas open for the oysters. Uh, I can't be certain of that, but uh, the shrimping, uh, there's a small area left on the, um, on the West Bank that's still open. And the East Bank is, <clears throat> I'd say 80% of the East Bank is open presently. But they're talking about starting to close. And you're it. talking about East Bank of the Mississippi River, right? My colleague right. I'm said, sorry. I'm sorry. No, sure. <laughs> East Bank of the Mississippi River. That's from the Mississippi State Line to uh, the, to Mississippi. I mean, to the Mississippi River. I'm sorry. Um, but what's happening with the shrimping? Because all the other areas are closed, it's caused a concentration of boats in one area. And the, uh, the shrimp can't handle that being pounded around the clock so hard. And w what's happening is the, the shrimp are, uh, are leaving. When normally they would stay, they're leaving. So it, it's a problem. It's, it's, uh, we don't have the area to work. We have a lot more people that are working the small areas that are left. And, and, and the oysters, right now the oyster industry is, is faced with a lot of regulations that just started this year with us with the uh, refrigeration requirements and, and, and this other stuff. And this is 
also a problem for the oyster fisheries because uh, the oystermen have to move to different areas in order to work, and it puts them further away from home base. And it's creating a problem with the, with the guys that have refrigeration and don't have refrigeration. Yeah, and I know, um, you know a lot's still being done to try to, to mitigate the disaster. Early off, everybody was talking about uh, what they're going to do after the oil hit, and so many of our people were saying, hold on a second. We want to be proactive. We want to stop the oil before it hits the marsh because once it gets into the marsh, it's going to be a whole different challenge, a much tougher challenge to clean it out than if you just keep it out in the first place. And that's why, of course, the top priority is still to get this, this well plugged, uh, but also to, to put a barrier in front of the marsh so that uh, the oyster stays away from the marsh and the seafood beds and it hopefully stops any of the real long-term damage from being done to areas that haven't already experienced it. So that's something that we've got to continue to push. One of the things I want to ask about, we hear all these ideas and there's, you know, we, I'm sure Charlie and I at least and the others on the committee, we get more ideas from people and some sound, you know, maybe somebody didn't get enough sleep, but some sound like they're brilliant ideas. And, and you wonder why they're not getting tried. And you see, you know, the hay that's put in the, in the water and it absorbs the oil. You've heard of the super tankers in Saudi Arabia. You've got Kevin Costner came here with a machine that, that transfers, uh, displaces the oil from the, from the water. You don't see any of these uh, being tried. Uh, there's more than enough good ideas that they should all be being tried throughout the Gulf right now. And if 10 of them work and 20 of them don't, you, you, you do more of the 10 that work and you keep doing more. But it just frustrates all of us to see that nothing is being tried from all of these brilliant ideas that you've heard. Have you, have you seen any of these put into action from all the things that you've seen and heard? No, I have not. Uh, uh and I don't know why BP, it would, it, it, would, it would seem that it would be in BP's best interest to try some of these ideas because it would help them to get this thing cleaned up. And uh, I, I really don't know. You were talking about Kevin Costner. Uh, last I heard about that is he was going to uh, come in this area and demonstrate it. And I haven't heard anything yeah. from it. And I saw since. the demonstrations. It looked like it worked. We've got we've to try some of these ideas. That's why we need a real chain of command instead of, you know, everybody's yes. in charge and nobody's in charge and nothing's getting done. Thank you. I yield back. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for your hospitality since we've been down here, too. Well, that concludes all the questions. I want to thank our witnesses for coming today and thank you for your testimony. I want to thank uh, St. Bernard's Parish for being a gracious host. Their staff has been great to work with and for lending us this building today and, and uh, also the area of Chalmette. Uh, we appreciate them, the opportunity to be here, to be down here with you. Um, our committee is continuing a method methodical investigation of this incident. We're looking at all the major factors and all the major entities that played a role or should have prevented this disaster from happening. This subcommittee will continue to investigate and hold hearings until we get the answers that we're looking for. And at times we will order members of uh, those responsible parties into Washington and we we'll try to get them to work out some of these problems that are confronting the local residents. So it's so important for us to be down here to learn firsthand. We want to thank everyone for being here. We plan on three more hearings uh, yet this month, just in this incident alone. So. We just don't do one hearing and forget about it and leave. We're going to stay with you through this whole process. Uh, we've asked some of the witnesses to supplement their testimony. We'd like you to do that if you could within 10 days. Uh, and members will also have 10 days to submit additional questions for the record that we would address to the appropriate witness. Again, thank you all for being here. Uh, that concludes our hearing. The meeting of the subcommittee is adjourned. Just give us five minutes and uh, some of us will come back out. Uh, members are invited to stay and we'll, if you have some further questions, we'll try to follow up with you then. Give us about five minutes. Tomorrow, President Obama starts a two-day visit to Florida, Mississippi, and Louisiana to look at the impact of the oil spill. We preview the trip on today's Washington Journal.